sharing on the live stream and then we can begin. One second. Uh, I'm going to let everyone in now, and then we can begin. Hello. Hi, Zemo. Hi, everyone. Hi, Anselmo. Hello. Hi, Jamila. Hello, Becky. Hi, everybody. Hello, Anselmo. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Just now you have a really hairstyle. Your hairstyle. My there's no hairstyle in Zelmo. It's just growing oh. after my chemo. Everything had gone. Now it's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you are really. But I'm enjoying this. I'm Everybody. Enjoying this. Oh, I need to wear the Kazakhstan hat. Just a minute. <laughs> Okay, so that's almost everyone in now, so we can just begin. Dear Jostan, nice to see you and good luck with your workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to show other t-shirts. And now you can start, Anselmo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to SDG 16 Plus Forum Asia, the second one following the first one in last year. My name is Anselmo Lee. I'm the regional coordinator of APSD, Asia Civil Society Partnership for Sustainable Development which is a you know, uh, partner and also co-organizer of this forum. As you know, we are going to have about three hour session to discuss and update the, what's happening in Asia in terms of SG16+. I believe you have received the program and three hour program, we have uh, four or five substantive sessions the, with the many speakers. And before we begin our uh, session one, I'd like to invite uh, Jamila Asanova, the co-chair of ADA, Asia Developed Alliance, which is a key organizer of this forum to give us a warm welcome and also opening remarks first. Okay, um, Jamila, over to you, please. Uh, hello, everyone, dear colleagues, friends, 
participants of the second SDG 16 plus forum Asia. Um, on behalf of Asia Development Alliance, I would like to make some opening remarks. Um, the lack of commitment and uh, uh, concentrate action from the governments poses detrimental traits of the people and the planet cough uh, amid the multidimensional crisis uh, component by COVID-19 in Asia. The UNESCO SDG Progress Report 2022 indicates that the SDGs will not be achieved in Asia and the Pacific until 2065, given the current piece, uh, pace of uh, progress. As the region is one of the most complex regions having diverse cultural identities and the financial uh, disparities, uh, where on the one hand from the Northeast Asian countries like Japan, South Korea, China are making their mark on the developed categories, where most of the South and the Southeast Asian countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Cambodia, and others are still struggling to run their economies. The military COP in Myanmar early in February 2029, followed by Taliban takeover in Afghanistan later in August 2021, and then Sri Lanka, <clears throat> Uh, I mean, just in early this year, Pakistan following this tweet, which was uh, further uh, exacerbated by the one of the uh, deadlight uh, floods uh, causing on millions of people, cattle, etc., to displace. <clears throat> also, some cases in Central Asia, I would say. Apart from the uh, immense uh, destruction from climate crisis, there is also a feudal element where big <clears throat> landlords have uh, uh, deliberately um, inundated agricultural land of small farmers in order to get rid of water from their land. The governments in all these countries have been performing poorly with uh, uh, negligible intervention. This humanitarian crisis is also happening as big businesses and rich capitalist nations are not committing to reduce their CO2 emissions, no, nor adding any uh, genuine solution to the climate emergency. On the other hand, actions to protect and build the resilience of communities and the vulnerable communities are not receiving enough support. But it's observed that the serious attention and the accountability measures are required within our responses, which will focus on the political and the durable solutions in communities, especially the most vulnerable and the marginalized. Uh, our humanitarian aid must also go hand on, in hand with concerned efforts on humanitarian um, advocacy and the equal political efforts for early and durable solution to mitigate the crisis at the moment. People from Asia region struggle as they find, uh, find themselves being left behind in the path towards just an um, equitable uh, discovery apart from being in the uh, midst of climate emergency, increasing sovereign um, debt crisis. Uh, and just rate of investment rules that limit policy and the fiscal space. The region is also uh, witnessing, uh, experiencing uh, vaccine um, inequity, all while corporate wealth and the power is growing, with a new um, billionaire being made every 26 hours since the pandemic started. Also, many countries are. Uh, confronted with uh, widening uh, debt traps, shrinking uh, official development uh, assistance and the corporate capture, all while struggling to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Hope this second uh, SDG Plus Forum uh, deliberates some of these key issues and they come up with specific recommendations for the policy makers. Thank you very much and uh, I wish this forum very best. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jamila. I think within uh, two minutes, you are able to capture the main, the component of the challenges in terms of SE6+. As you may know, SE16 is a 
uh, many of us we believe is the most difficult, uh, most important, but it's also most complex. Uh, the the goal among seventeen SDGs composed of peace, justice, and inclusion. And that's why we have uh, many issues to discuss on the SG 6 plus, because this is a key to address uh, multiple uh, interconnected issues of the peace, justice, and democracy. I believe you have read uh, the short concept notes and then the agenda. I want to highlight once again, that's why we are organizing this uh, forum in partnership with uh, many other partner organizations of course, ADA is a key, and then we have APSC, which I'm representing here, and also JANIC, Japan NGO Center for International Cooperation, and also FOROS International. All of us are the members of this FOROS, and also TEM Network, a Transparency, Accountability, and Participation, which is global umbrella of NGOs working on SG16, and also GCAP, a Global Call to Action Against Poverty. So one of the longest uh, campaign uh, among civil societies, starting from the MDG time, the now SDG, especially focusing on inequality and many other related issues. So they will join us as a speaker or moderator and also a contributor from the floor. So with this short introduction, uh, without further ado, so let me invite the moderator of session one. As you know, if you look at the program, we begin with the voice from the ground, the youth voice. Then we will go to the global substantive issues. And then the last uh, session is uh, ways forward. You know, what can we do together? I believe you have seen the uh, report, the statement, declaration of SE6 plus 2021. So based on your input and discussion, we are going to update the, this declaration, which can be a guide for our common action uh, uh, coming days. So now may I invite uh, Josna? to begin the, the session one with your moderator. Thank you so much, Anselmo, for a nice introduction about the SDG 16 forum. And, uh, you know, this is the second SDG 16 forum actually we are organizing this year. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be doing in person if we have a better situation, both time and resource wise. Uh, so thank you all. And uh, this is the session where we are as Anselmo said, that we are going to listen to the voices from the grass, from the ground, and uh, some of them are, uh, uh, are, are youth activists actually from the countries where uh, you know uh, the situation is really tough. Uh, so I would uh, again invite uh, some of the participants. Um, I, you know, you know, I would also suggest that uh, uh, even we are recording the session, please do not make it. Uh, uh, please do not make it public, and because I know our participant from Afghanistan might face a lot of problem because he's known among uh, Taliban's and other groups. So it would be, you know, it would be really nice to maintain the privacy uh, from our uh, colleagues, uh, from especially from Afghanistan. So again, um, without again further ado, I would invite my first uh, participant, my brother, my colleague from Afghanistan, Rahi. Uh, Rahi, uh, are you here? Can you please share yes. your screen? Um, no, sorry, just to interrupt quickly, if you want to have more privacy, we can pause the recording or stop it or stop the streaming. Just um, let me know what you would prefer. Um, I think Rahi, uh, do you think uh, we should we stop the live streaming until you speak? Uh, that's fine. I mean, no, I mean, that's fine. Uh, uh, I'll be cool with that. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah. So uh, it's my turn, right? Should I start? Yes, Rahi, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jotna, Jamila, and everyone for the uh, invite. Uh, so, uh, good, mo uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, it's an honor to speak today in this uh, important platform uh, to present to you the current situation in Afghanistan under the uh, uh, Taliban regime. As you're all well aware, this is a crisis like no other in which uh, we are living in Afghanistan. A lot of issues, a lot of restrictions, a lot of things happening uh, in, in the ground. Uh, but I would like to brief you on some of the crucial challenges that Afghan NGOs, civil society, and, and the people are facing on, on, on a daily basis. Uh, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that we have, uh, women and girls, uh, they are totally erased from the uh, system. They are erased from the whole 
um, seem like they can I mean, women, they cannot work in, in government right now. I mean, all the previous employees of the government, they are at home, they cannot work. We have some women that they work in the uh, uh, NGOs, um, uh, but still with some conditions, uh, what the NGOs are to, what the mahram, if they are moving around, uh, what separate space in the office for women. And then, you know, uh, the girls' education, secondary and high schools are still closed. Uh, there's no uh, movement that they will open the, 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 uh, the schools. And, you know, uh, delivery of humanitarian assistance in addition to regime influence is highly impacted by banking and cash liquidity crisis. Organizations do not have access to uh, sufficient funds to pay staff uh, salaries and procurement and pay vendors and deliver vital assistance at the uh, uh, required scale. Uh, currently, this remains a serious impediment uh, for organizations delivering assistance, in particular for Afghan NGOs. Um, you know, there's a, a, there are a lot of uh, restrictions being imposed uh, by the IE authorities on, on NGOs. Uh, there's a new, uh, new regulatory framework developed by IEA de facto authorities uh, without any uh, uh, consultation with NGOs or the humanitarian community, which contradicts our humanitarian principles, the joint operating principles, and, and, and the NGO law itself. So this uh, document is uh, already given to all the provinces and it's being applied by, uh, uh, by the authorities at local level as well. Well, we have some, uh, we have discussion with them, we had, and, and, and uh, uh, even today we have a, a meeting with a, a deputy prime minister uh, regarding specific uh, this uh, restrictions imposed on the NGOs. So let's see how it goes. I mean, today at three in, in one hour, I have a meeting there uh, with the UN heads in Akbar and I am there. So let's see uh, how it goes. Uh, and also uh, there are certain activities recently uh, uh, by the uh, uh, IEA authorities or de facto authorities are stopped, for example, Women empowerment activities, gender-based uh, uh, activities, uh, and then different activities, and then peace. So they have stopped these activities, and and the NGOs are not able to to uh, implement these activities. And uh, there are a lot of lot of other issues that we are struggling with. We are facing uh, working in Afghanistan. It's not an easy environment now. Uh, 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 I mean. Also, the capacity of, of the local authorities is very low. They don't know, they don't understand the role of the NGOs. Uh, and, and, and one of the reasons is like what impediment reason is, is their capacity that they don't understand. And then, then there that uh, religious uh, perspective that they have, the thinking that they have is quite different. And then the interpretation of the Sharia is quite different and then from others. So there are a lot of challenges that we are facing. I think the time was given for me four, four minutes, but I, I'll just have a few recommendations to, to the international communities, uh, to, the, to the world outside Afghanistan. But you know, today, uh, uh, Taliban is a reality. I mean, they have the whole system, they have the whole country, and, 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 and they're ruling the people, 35 million people, just a few thousand. So, uh, the, the point is that we should not bargain this 35 million people with just a few thousand. So our recommendation is that uh, the dialogue with the IE authorities at all levels must continue, along with the orientation and training on, for example, humanitarian principles, standard and standards, and IHL, the humanitarian response system, AGO code of conduct, AAP and PCA policies and responses, and the joint operating principles. So important to understand that the, any discussion training is not a one-time thing. Uh, it will require constant reflection, training, dialogue, and negotiation. And also, it is important that all actors hold the, the Taliban accountable for their commitments that they have made in different platforms. It is recorded and also it's a, a, a written uh, um, commitment that, that they have made. For instance, I mean, they made some commitments in Oslo. They have made commitments in, in Geneva. They have, I mean, there was a letter in last September 10 uh, to Martin Griffiths uh, 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 that they say that we will remove all the impediments before the NGOs pass in the current impediments. We will make an enabling, enabling environment for the uh, NGOs. So for those uh, 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 commitment that they have made, which is recorded, they should be account, uh, uh, hold accountable for it by the uh, uh, international communities. And uh, we are doing it. We are holding them accountable. I mean, uh, uh, in, in nationally here, and it, it really works. 
So um, yeah, that's uh, and also um, uh, international community should also engage in collective joint advocacy with the de facto authorities to ensure that all staff members, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or race or religion, are are able to work in a free, unhindered, and unrestricted manner that respects the basic rights and humanitarian principles. I advocate with the de facto authorities to develop a unified policy for women's um, equal participation in the workforce that would be uni uniformly implemented and consistently enforced at all levels, community decision at national level. So there are a lot of uh, uh, issues, there are a lot of recommendations, but I think there are constraints. So I'll stop here. If there's any questions, so I'm here. Yeah, to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother, for your very nice presentation and the speech, the issues that you've raised, the education of women, uh, mainstreaming NGOs, and how the communication with the authorities are very important, and also to remind the uh, Taliban, uh, you know, about the commitments that they've made. They've made. I think they are, these are some of the issues that we really need to keep in mind. And uh, thank you so much, uh, friends. If you have more questions to Rahi, uh, please, Rahi, I would request you to please wait um, and please uh, please stay uh, here. So I'm sure there would be questions uh, after this session. So thank you so much again. And now I invite my next speaker uh, from uh, Sri Lanka, Nasreen, uh, who's going to speak about the Sri Lankan uh, issues now. Nasreen, are you here? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry, uh, my camera is not working. Is it okay to uh, wait a minute? Right. Wait, I will try to. Is it okay off my camera? I'm uh, coming through my phone. Is it okay? Sure. Sure, Nasreen. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Nasreen from Sri Lanka. I'm going to explain what are the situation in Sri Lanka, what's going on in these days. Uh, really, in young people in Sri Lanka, public and private institutes are given uh, given an opportunity to engage in effort to achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, especially uh, compared to the other development countries except Sri, La except Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, the opportunity given to Sri Lankan youth is very limited, uh, mainly STD, Sustainable Development Goals area, mm, and uh, their rights uh, have been violated in many places. Recently, in Sri Lankan, uh, people are calling in Aragale protest period, their youth uh, rights are right, not only youth and women's rights are violated from Sri Lanka, but uh, in some way, yeah, we can see the uh, what's a, a Sri Lankan government mainly they are looking some areas in the what's a we have uh, directly uh, they involve some uh, SCD goals mainly they are thinking about the uh, policy making in the in the area is mean Sri Lankan Parliament and its uh, associated public service will be include the policy series to make some contribution towards sustainable development. In this regard, non-government organization and UN agencies uh, consider their, uh, this is a very important fact in for formulating for policies for their future opportunities. Uh -huh. But all these events, uh, but all these events are uh, carried out without the knowledge of their uh, gender, uh, general public expect to top leaders and few subordinates. So it is uh, difficult to achieve the real goal of this scheme. In fact, the Sustainable Development uh, 2030 uh, direct in Sri Lanka has been functioned as a project limited to books and public so far. The result of this is the economic and social crisis that have occurred in Sri Lanka in recent times. When uh, comparing 2015 with the year 2022, it can be seen some statistics in Sri Lanka has 
experienced a fast regulations that the year 2015 all through the reason for this are the behavior of the politi uh, politics and some environment issues also there uh, we can see some uh, uh, short of economical uh, issues in there uh, some uh, which are the uh, poverty rate in 2000 19 we have in 10 percentage poverty in the total population but uh, nowadays is increased increased uh, short of uh, researchers are showing to 11.7 it increased at the, at the uh, also same the education level also we are facing some lot of issues in education streams also mainly schools are closed these days Uh, not only covid situation but also the uh, economical crisis affected to the young people's education also in sri lanka is a free education system going on uh, so we can see the campus universities are almost closed so it's a huge huge issues to sri lankan young people facing their education is going to down it mean it's going Lower level to uh, people's uh, education is challenging to the uh, society, as well as uh, we can see some uh, religious issues. Uh, Sri Lankan is a normal, and uh, we have Muslims, Hindu, Buddhist, and Tamil people are living here. So some politicians are using to the people to racist or some r- radical issues creating in the politicians also. a very huge issue in sri lanka at the same time lot of young youth people are involved to this they don't have any idea they don't have any knowledge to future but some politicians and some agencies are using to these people at the same time women participation also sri lanka using uh, facing some credible situation uh this times uh, after the sri lankan sri lanka has a uh, past 30 years war experience also i don't know why sri lankan come just give me one minute some... yeah thank you okay uh right uh, at the same time uh, uh, education level also i i spoke to you and reconciliation side sri lanka uh, after the past war they are try to the sri lankan uh, mainly age ngos local ngos and uh, ingos are try to make a peace building into the sri lankan community but day to day every uh, short of uh, small small issues are pop on the areas in muslims and buddhists uh, tamils and muslims christians and muslims like this uh, day to day small small issues are creating at the land issues still also some disappear peoples we cannot find in the peace situation almost youths are fa- youths are thinking to say, challenge to live in sri lanka most people youngsters are migrating from here health issues also same these are the main factor in sri lanka i think uh, sri lankan peoples are facing thank you Is it all? Thank you. Have more. Thank you so much, Christine, uh, for yeah, your very nice presentation. You talked about the issues of youth, issues, the religious uh, conflicts, and uh, how the roles of politicians, how they are inflicting uh, these kinds of controversies in the society. And um, I believe youth have a very, very important role to play. And um, if you want to see the full uh, video of Nasreen, uh, I have the. Uh, recording so i can share with all of you uh, i can share the google drive where you can uh, see the whole video uh, thank you so much nasreen and uh, now i call my next presenter from uh, myanmar uh, may are you here uh, yes i am may may is from myanmar and may the floor is yours now you have 4 minutes Yeah, thank you so much yeah uh, hello everyone a great day i am mei chuzo from myanmar firstly i would like to thank the stg system plus isha for an organizer for giving me this opportunity as you all know 
currently in Myanmar is under a political crisis with the backgrounds of over 70 years long civil wars. Myanmar was a city in the points behind the 2021 sustainable development in the Asia Pacific region. Over 10% are out of school in lower secondary with girls in rural areas and poor household being more disadvantaged. Myanmar was the second highest in secondary and tertiary education after Cambodia in comparison to the Asia Pacific region for inequality of opportunities and barriers by 2016 data among the latest in 2019. COVID-19 pandemic struck the wall in the year 2020 after the declaration of the outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern at the on 11 March 2020, schools in many parts of the world were fully or partially closed to reduce the spread of the COVID-19. According to the UN SDG 2020 data, schools were closed from 16 March that year in Myanmar. There were over 9 million learners were affected by COVID and 6,000 out of 47,000 business education schools were repurposed as quarantine centers. Although plans were drawn up to restart education, many schools could not meet reopening requirements for classroom site or sanitation. Nearly a third of schools in conflict affected area do not even have access to water. While Myanmar is struggling with the COVID pandemic, people, including their students, they face their double trouble because of military state at coup year 2021. And nationwide teachers' strike has been ongoing since the coup happened by the attacks on education in Myanmar data. Within three months after the coup, 102 teachers are incidents, 66 teachers are arrested, 35 teachers are injured, and then the military contrast has suspended the contrast of 130,000 teachers, which is a nearly a third of the workforce. Similarly, there is a national student employment called of state education. The Myanmar Teachers Federation says 90% of students refuse to enroll for the 2021-22 academic year. Attacks on school have increased since the coup, but there is not a new phenomenon. In 2017, UNICEF called on the military and then the ethnic organizations to protect school following a series of attacks that year. Low attendance is also not a new pro problem. The official high school dropout rate in 2020 was 30%, which is quite high. SDGs are linking each other as a spider web. And being a global citizen, and if there is an impact on the world, I can begin a victim as well. Education is very important, not only for Myanmar, but for all global citizens. We need to have a backup plan for every phenomenon needs if a crisis has happened, and need to make sure that will not happen again in the future. Myanmar faces backsliding in every sustainable development goal. Since a peaceful and inclusive society is very fundamental in current Myanmar, and Myanmar can be achieved SDGs by 2030 only from the restoration of peace. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, May, for your very nice presentation. And they say if you want to break a country, uh, disrupt the education system. And that's what is happening. So we really hope that uh, the situation improves and the uh, and we have uh, and the democracy is uh, restored in the country. I know many of my friends from Myanmar. They have already they are they have gone to different countries. They have taken asylum, but not everyone is that fortunate. They are there playing their uh, battle. Uh, they are fighting their battle. So all our solidarity with you all. Um, and then uh, coming to the last presentation, I am inviting my. Uh, uh, my, my, my colleague from Pakistan, Mahavish. Uh, Mahavish, are you here? Mahavish, can you hear me? If you cannot, then I have, uh, maybe she is not yet joined. If you allow me, I can, uh, I can play the video which she has recorded for us. Uh, so just give me um, half a second, half a minute, sorry, not second.
Hello, my name is Sam Shani. I am Program Manager for United Global Organization of Development, UGOD. So, peace, stability, human rights, and effective governance based on the rule of law are important conduits for sustainable development. We are living in the world that is increasingly divided. Some preachers enjoy sustained levels of peace, security, prosperity, while others fall into seamlessly endless cycles of conflict and violence. This is by no means inevitable and must be addressed. Goal 16 is the main goal for fostering peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, which are free from fear and violence. But SDG 16 should not be seen in isolation. It has strongly with other goals in line with the integrated and indivisible nature of the agenda, which highlights its importance for Pakistan as the current scenario of super floods and continuously depreciating it. Can you see it? Hello, my name is Amish Kani. I'm Program Manager of United Global Organization. Of Sorry, uh, I think there are some issues with the video, but I believe uh, Mehvish is already here. Mehvish? Mehvish, can you hear me? Mavish, can you hear me? You need to unmute yourself. Okay, I think uh, we have some uh, issues uh, with Mavish joining us. Uh, so maybe we'll, um, sorry, we, because we have very Hello, limited. Hi. Okay, Mavish, please go ahead. I'm so sorry because I was busy in another consultation, so I just got free. So sorry for that. Yes, the floor is yours. Mary. Okay, my time started. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, as uh, for the TED talk, I was given uh, the opportunity. So I will start with, uh, I'm Mavish Kiani and I'm the program manager of UGOOD, United Global Organization of Development. So peace, stability, human rights, and effective governance based on the rule of law are important conduits for sustainable development. And we are living in the world that is increasingly divided. Some regions enjoy a sustained level of peace, security, and prosperity, while others fall into seamlessly endless cycles of conflict and violence. This is by no means is inevitable and this must be addressed. So goal 16 is the main goal for fostering peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, which are free from fear and violence, but SDG 16 should not be seen in isolation. It has strong links with other goals in line with the integrated and indivisible nature of the agenda, which highlights its importance for Pakistan as the current scenario of super floods and continuously depreciating economic situation has made us aware of the existing fault lines that are eating up the society and the country as a whole. Pakistan's government is paying the price of years of delays in addressing the problems, corruption as, and mismanagement of countries, uh, water resources, a lack of necessary infrastructure, weak governance. So better governance is need of art. That is why SG 16 is highly relevant to Pakistan. I would also like to emphasize target 16.3 of SDG 16, which is promote the rule of law at the national and international level and ensure equal access to justice for all. This target highly relevant in the current context, as I mentioned above that super flood in Pakistan due to climate change have laid bare the injustice that is being done to the people of Pakistan, especially those affected by the floods. While Pakistan has the least role in bringing about the climate change with very low emission levels. So we need to hold the countries responsible for bringing about climate change accountable in order to lessen such catastrophic impacts of climate change. The flood have taken away a huge toll on human lives, cattle and livelihoods have been destroyed and uh, crops have been totally destroyed, causing a damage of millions of dollars of Pakistan. So this situation is not only happening in Pakistan, but also in Asia and Africa. So someone needs to stop this. And, um, and, and with concern to the achievement, so ensuring the achievement of SDG 16 plus is still a challenge for many countries around the globe. Awareness is the first component as per uh, 
but i think that it is the first component toward achieving the agile 16 plus and other goal as we need to talk about it in our circles for people to have a basic understanding and purpose of the goal this is one of the reason we have gathered here for the ted talk so that we pass on the narrative and try to talk about things that matter moreover the government must take SDGs their priority and try to achieve maximum targets for the betterment of respective states so that's all from my side. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Jyotishna. Thank you so much, Mavish, for sticking to the time. And um, it's nice to uh, see you again. And, um, you know, uh, so we know the climate crisis that Pakistan is uh, witnessing apart from the economic crisis. Uh, so uh, Mavish has spoken about this from the youth perspective. Uh, so there would be, I know, many questions, but um, uh, maybe we can uh, have the questions, all the questions in the last, uh, at the end of the session. Uh, I would request our speakers to please, uh, uh, please stay here. And now I give the floor back to Anselmo to create the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my, my speakers. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much again for excellent presentation, especially sharing of your story and perspective. Uh, especially most difficult situations uh, like Myanmar, Afghanistan, and Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Of course, we have also many other challenges in uh, other parts of the, of the world and also in Asia. But uh, please uh, feel free to write down your comment and question in the chat box, and the speakers will address your question later on. So we have a last session. Uh, final session is take away. No? It's a time to make a comment and also uh, it's not really conclusion, but kind of synthesis of the, all the good uh, suggestion um, as a, uh, the main point for takeaway. Uh, since uh, we have very tight schedule, let's move to the next session. Session two is SG16 plus Asia. So we start from the ground, but now we are going up a little bit, especially SGG. You know? uh, so we have uh, two types of presentation. First one is uh, as I mentioned, we have adopted the declaration last year, you know. So Josna is going to give us a short uh, review of what happened, you know, uh, 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 to this uh, declaration. And then we had a very interesting meeting the two weeks ago. Um, APSD, together with the ADA, we have a conducted very interesting sub-regional research about SDG, you know, whether SDG has been implementing in Asia in terms of three sub-regions, South Asia, Central Asia, Southeast Asia. So we have a three the researchers who has been working on this topic, SDG, but they are going to present today in terms of SG 16 plus. You know? So they are going to use the international data to give us to uh, kind of perspective how to assess SDG as a whole in terms of uh, SG 16. So let's begin with uh, Josna. Just now we have a five to 10 minutes about uh, introduce the creation who are not familiar, especially those who are not familiar with the, the last year, the creation. And then, so what happened after that? Uh, please, uh, just now over to you. Thank you so much, Anselmo. Uh, again, <laughs> I would not take much time. I would just say that, you know, last year we organized the first SDG 16 plus forum. Um, and thank you so much, GCAP and Global uh, People's Assembly. We, we got a first, uh, uh, you know, opportunity to speak and to, to share our issues from SDG 16 plus. Uh, it was a very good deliberation. We had about, uh, uh, you know, 75 plus uh, participants uh, from Asia and some uh, also from the globe. Um, so we came up with the declaration uh, and some of those points that I would want to raise here, uh, you know, what the declaration basically talks about. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, as I said, that the, the participation was very diverse and, um, um, you know, and we want, and that also included not only civil society, but also some of the parliamentarians, some of those uh, people from, from United Nations. But this time we wanted to make it very CSO because uh, we have been, uh, they, uh, you know, we thought that we will be we should be coming up with our own agenda our without being influenced and then uh, we can uh, share the declaration to different policy makers so um and uh, you know the declaration was also based on the uh, reforms on the international peace architecture uh, as articulated in our common agenda uh, recently published by the un secretary general uh, and this it also established an official annual, annual multi-stakeholder sdg 16 plus forum in asia uh, then um, 
you know, there was increasing, uh, there was talk about increase the provision of international development finance through the World Bank and the IMF to enhance peace, human rights, democracy and governance in the Asia region. This is a very important topic because we are talking about lo lots of implementation, but if we do not have the finance, you know, we are stuck there and then there's a lot of dependency on the private sector. This year, high level political forum also was kind of uh, inclining towards, it was like, uh, you know, uh, towards the private sector, it was very much, uh, they're speaking in their language. So I think it's very important for the civil society to get involved in that. Uh, there was some part, uh, some of the recommendation was to establish a UN regional human rights review mechanism for Asia, then establishing an immediate access and safe haven for the millions of civilians who are fle fleeing from Myanmar and Afghanistan and other countries. Uh, then with the benefit of the hindsight, it is clear how the lack of integrated and inclusive approach to decision making within certain countries coupled with the system with the systemic erosion of democratic values over time has led to overall uh, system failure we see in many countries now uh, last day there were two there this year there are many other countries from south asia uh, we, there is a lack of governance and accountability and uh, you know we demand accountability from the government um, there was a renewed call of action from the civil society and other stakeholders from across the region, uh, especially about the commitment to the effective collection and um, collective implementation of SDG 16 plus. As we know, this is a, uh, critical to the successful implementation of all the other sustainable development because you know, SDG 16 is considered as the accelerator of the, all the goals. So if, if SDG 16 is regressing, that means we are all the goals are regressing. Uh, especially in you know in terms in if you're talking about the about the authoritarian regime from all over East Southeast Asian and South Asian countries, uh, unfortunately today we uh, witness a worsening situation in Asia where inclusive decision making is concerned, and many governments are moving in the opposite direction. Uh, so they were called for uh, you know from uh, for our the, the authorities in um, uh, on uh, in Afghanistan, uh, we call for the United Nations and international communities to. Uh, you know, to increase the support for the emergency evacuation, relocation, resettlement operation, et cetera, and to create an enabling environment for human rights, freedom and liberty of people, especially regarding the women's human rights. Uh, in Myanmar, the deep root of ethnic discrimination prevent the country from becoming fully uh, unified and uh, achieving peace. And military authorities have exploited the, in uh, a general lack of ethnic understanding and solidarity that needs to be taken care of. Um, and then there was call for UN member state and international organization to reform the international peace architecture as articulated in our common agenda, then ensure that national government, UN institution, international donors and global civil society unite for the cause of peace, protection of human rights and democracy across the Asia region, apply sanctions to any country whose government is not legitimate, remove any particular trading arrangement and seize commercial uh, operation within it, uh, rebuild democratic models to make them um, more people-centric and representative and ensuring the availability of adequate process of citizens dialogue. Uh, then uh, linking SDG 16 plus means recognize the critical interlinkage between SDG 16 plus and other SDGs, especially during COVID-19. So urging government to commit more uh, towards urgent action on SDG 16 plus and to clearly outline what they are doing regarding the implementation of the 2030 agenda, recognize the role of CSO data spotlight reporting, use tools such as the SDG 16 plus CSO toolkit by TAP network and others who are uh, in this field. Uh, then human rights and partnerships support strong popular movements in ASEAN countries to put pressure uh, on other respective government, uh, but now we have added, uh, apart from ASEAN, uh, all the countries from uh, all the region, uh, ASEAN, um, Central Asia, South Asia, urging government to, uh, uh, you know, to to, uh, uh, to take care of the DAC recommendation on enabling civil society, uh, which were adopted on 6 July, seriously, and no change there, and, and to change their policies and practices accordingly. Capacity building is another important part that we really need to give uh, capacity building, which is a best framework uh, to set the agenda for capacity building. Uh, to address issues of human rights, criminal justice, and, uh, and upholding the rule of law. Humanitarian assistance, increased humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan, um, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and other countries who are facing such problems. Uh, then restore peace and stop violence. Uh, so, you know, this declaration was basically, this was drawn up uh, based on wide ranging presentation and deliberation during the SDG 16 forum that we organized last year and inputs were provided by the participating uh, participating um, organizations from across Asia and internationally. 
so this is a very brief of the i'm sorry i was just going super fast but i will share the declaration <laughs> with all of you and you can have a look at this so thank you so much anselmo again back to you okay thank you very much very speed and then but excellent summary of the major key points for action as you know the uh chat park there is a full text you can download the full text you know but already we got we captured the, the essence of this declaration from uh josna so let's uh continue so now let me invite the uh, three the researchers one after another let's begin with the uh, central asia you know i'm waiting always a uh, central asia kazakhstan you know to show our solidarity with the uh, people in um central asia they are central asia but somehow for political reasons they have been away from the whole Asia community. You know? So now we want to really embrace uh, Central Asia to make uh, Asia all, you know, really truly Asia, you know, as a whole family. So Nurugul, so uh, welcome again. So could you please uh, share the main point, result of your research uh, in terms of SDG? You have a uh, 10 minutes, please, Nurugul. Thank you. Can you, uh, will you allow me to uh, share screen? Oh, uh, yes, we'll make you. I'm very yep. happy to share some of our results while Anselma is dealing with the technical issues. I'm happy to share some results from Central Asia. I've, um, I've just made you co-host there, Nargal, so you should be able to share your screen. Yep. Okay. Perfect. I think um, I need to take it out. Do you see my screen? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Nurgul Jarnaeva. I'm from Bish I'm from Bishkek, and we'll be uh, talking about the issue that we are discussing right now. Um, I will share some key findings from the data from SDG Plus 16 perspective, some data and recommendations. I will be using and refer making reference to some of the documents below. Uh, let's talk about the goal 16 in the region. If you look at the current assessment taken in the SDSN report, we'll see that all our countries actually are challenged very much in implementation of this goal. So major challenges remain. And the most important, you look at the trend. Uh, majority are still stagnant. And this is a warning message for us. And some in some countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, moderately improving. This is also something for our advocacy. Enabling environment um, impacts on the CS, uh, SDG uh, speed and development effectiveness. Enabling environment is one of the indicators, of course. So uh, National development planning actually are not at this moment uh, providing meaningful engagement mechanism for civil society organizations. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, talking about the SDG 16, it's important to pay attention uh, to the civic space or enabling environment. Some data from Central Asian countries are also telling about the quite um, um, nasty situation in uh, for the civil society. Uh, only Mongolia is narrowed, others are obstructed or repressed or closed and closed. And Kazakhstan moved from uh, obstructed to repressed. This is also a big signal of the data. And this is also maybe used for our um, further advocacy. But talking about the situation, it's important to also highlight that some governments are doing some efforts and maybe it would be good to share those lessons. But these lessons are not totally positive. So some positive practices, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan actually released national strategies specifically uh, uh, focused on civil society uh, engagement. Uh, it's also important that in Central Asia, there is now a process led by civil society platforms uh, to start collecting our own data on the neighboring environment. And uh, I think it's a good um, case for, to replicate uh, so that national and regional organizations were coming up with their own data because the previous data was, previous data was coming from 
Credit Risk International. Now we, are, we have some improvement, but now we are uh, uh, thinking about collecting our own data. Uh, there is uh, some interesting things really uh, coming from the reports uh, on SDG. UNESCAP report says that um, data for most of the of goal 16 are not available to measure actual progress. Probably for us, it's also a signal to put our advocacy focus on um, strengthening the indicator base. Goal number 16 depends not only on democracy, not only on civic space, but also on the human rights, human rights framework in the countries. So um, some recommendations were coming up from the universal periodic reviews. Recommendations were coming to our, our countries. The table is very uh, small, but this is just to refer that numerous recommendations, many recommendations were provided by UN human rights bodies to our countries to improve the situation. But because national human rights protection mechanism in our region is very weak, uh, it is important now to focus our advocacy for linking and making working the indicators, the recommendations that are coming up from UPR, from CEDA, from other UN treaty bodies. So uh, these recommendations worth of our attention and, we, and they are also telling us, uh, showing us where we can go also. But the process at this moment of advancing implementation of sustainable development in our countries and advancing of human rights are not interlinked. And this is a common um, challenge for whole Asia. If we look at Central Asia from the top areas of concern from, for the inclusive, for the human rights um, uh, implementation, we can see that situation from this perspective is very far from meeting promised commitments in implementations. The major areas uh, are the following five themes, equality and non-discrimination, freedom of opinion and expression and access to information, women's rights, gender equality are under risk. And there is also a group of um, vulnerable layers of society who need more attention, persons with disability and children. And we need to take into account when we monitor, when we work, we engage with the government. The same information is coming up from people's scorecard reports this year and the previous years uh, uh, from our region. It is important to focus our attention on the following areas of the SDG implementation in our region. First, public awareness and capacity development is very weak. And it is very linked to the issue that we are discussing. We need to be more aware. We need to be more capacitated, much more strong. There is also a common uh, warning message. Very low scores receive the uh, monitoring mechanisms of all indicators. We have very low monitoring mechanisms, which logically lead to weak transparency accountability. So all these areas are rated low also in people's COCA. So we looked at the international data, we looked at the UN data, we looked at um, uh, civil society data. Some recommendations. We have a number, we developed quite a big number of recommendations, but let me to add to some that I already voiced now. We need to strengthen solidarity in our civil society advocacy. And I was very happy to hear when previously and especially keys from our solidarity and to support each other, like we are doing now, for example. We need to advocate recommend another recommendation is to um advocate for strengthening human rights-based approach to the SDGs. There is a lot of already developed concrete substantial messages. Now it's our task to make them working for SDG. 
CSOs are recommended to advocate for institutionalized participation of civil society organizations in further planning, implementation, and monitoring of the SDG implementation in our countries. It is important to support such initiatives, sub-regional initiatives, for example, from Central Asia, support the development of Central Asian think tank on CSO enabling environment. It is in process now under the framework of the I for Change platform in Central Asia. I think it's important to ensure that Central Asian countries and Mongolia have mechanisms uh, and um, mechanisms in our countries are strengthened for inclusive engagement in all aspects of development process. All reports, all data is telling that there are constraints for civil society. So we probably should come up in the end of this, our gathering and in the process of our collaboration further, come up with a mechanism to address constraints on civil society that negatively affect sensual ability to participate and to contribute to national development processes. Also one small uh, thing that may be of big importance and Jotsna mentioned about funding and role of donors I think it's important for us to participate in the fourth round, fourth monitoring round of the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation that is planned for 23. Sorry, I put 21, it's a mistake. For 23. Next year, there will be monitoring um, within the framework of Global Partnership Monitoring with a focus on engagement of civil society. We can use that data later. Let me finish my. <clears throat> So talk with conclusion, data on human rights in Central Asia from UPR and from other UN treaties demonstrate that situation is quite far from uh, human rights perspective and it's not meeting promised commitments. CSO's space is shrinking in the region and it is um, subsequently and logically contributing to slow progress which we observe in all our region and in Central Asia. It is important that contribution of civil society to the sustainable development were adequately highlighted in the VNR. Majority of Central Asian countries are coming up with another VNR in 23. So it's important for us and for all other Asian countries, Asia Pacific countries who will be uh, submitting VNRs next year. So uh, civil society organizations input to sustainable development was highlighted. Otherwise it is not recognized. And that is also a political um, a momentum that civil society is not recognized and as an equal partner to the development of the country. So it should be institutionalized in the process of decision-making bodies on SDGs. At this moment, civil society participation is more nominal. Where it is substantial, it is more eclectical. Thank you so much. Okay, I hope you. I uh, followed your timeline. Oh, uh, I think it's okay because you have uh, shared with us uh, very substantive and useful information. So while listening to you, I try to put out all the reference, the website. <laughs> So that those who are not familiar with the topic you're addressing, they can also follow up, you know? So you can um, you know, check the website later on and they will compile all uh, presentation together with uh, some uh, reference information so that you can study further, you know? So thank you again, uh, very good summary of the major the available data and also the implication and challenges. Let's move to now South Asia. Now Suget from SAPE. You have also 10 minutes for your presentation. Um, thank you, Anselmo, and thank you, Jutsun, as well, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk. Um, uh, me also, I have to share my screen, <laughs> if possible. Um, yes, I think so. All right. So let me jump down to the first slide. All right. So, um, so we. Today we're talking about SDG 16 in uh, South Asia. Um, 
So SCG 16 deals with the core issues of peace, justice, and strong institutions, and thus is known as the cornerstone to uh, cornerstone to remaining other goals. The basic concept of SDG 16 plus is that this goal should not be seen in isolation. Uh, for instance, um, uh, some relevant targets for South Asia, target 16.1, which aims to significantly reduce all forms of violence and related death rates everywhere can be fulfilled. Only once uh, we are able to fulfill the target 5.2, that is eliminate all forms of violence against all women, and girls. Similarly, target 16.2, that is, end abusive exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against uh, and torture of children cannot be achieved unless we take immediate and effective measures to eradicate um, forced labor and modern slavery and human trafficking um, and secure the prohibition uh, and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including recruitment and uh, use of child soldiers by 2025. Um, and um, in child labor in all its forms, um, mentioning target 8.7. Uh, um, SDGs in the context of South Asia, one of the fastest growing regions in the world, aggregate GDP well in excess of USD 3 trillion, population 1.8 billion. However, it has significant uh, deficits in human development, 37% of the world's poor, and nearly half of the world's malnourished uh, children come from the region. So this is um, a little glimpse of the South, uh, the SDG index for South Asia. So you can see uh, Afghanistan and, um, ranks pretty low. Um, uh, Maldives and Bhutan, they seem a little bit better as compared to the other countries. So um, let, me, let me just move on because um, I want to spend more time for the analysis. Um, so average <coughs> score for South Asian countries are uh, 51.28 for Afghanistan. This is over the last five years, 62.28 for Bangladesh, 68 for Bhutan, 60.5 for India. Maldives is 70, Nepal is 65.06, uh, Pakistan 56.74 and Sri Lanka 67.08. Some highlights are uh, uh, Maldives fear the best. Um, as I said, um, obtaining an average score of 70, um, closely followed by Bhutan. Of all the countries, Bhutan leads in the three of the five years, except in 2019 and 22, where it falls uh, behind Maldives in both the years. On the opposite spectrum, Afghanistan, with an average of 51.28, stands at the worst performing, performing country for the last five years. Uh, SCG 16 in the context of South Asia. So um, SCG uh, 16 for South Asia, we see a little bit of uh, progress or um, this is from a UNS cap. So what they've said is that uh, in terms of 16.6 effective institutions, uh, there's a little bit of, um, so they, this need to be maintained. Um, you know, this progress needs to be maintained uh, to achieve the target. Um, a little bit behind is a reduction of violence and related deaths. Uh, this needs to be accelerated uh, progress to achieve the target. Uh, human trafficking looks pretty bad. And um, there isn't a lot of um, data that can be measured for all, all of the other goals, other targets under the 16 plus or 16, as I said. Um, just a overall uh, progress report for South Asia. So all of the goals are here. Let me look at goal 16. And I, I've already explained how all other goals are already you know, related to the goal 16. But even if we just look at 16, it paints a pretty dismal picture. So um, all reds, except for Bhutan, which is yellow, which is the second worst. And it's, it says it's improving, but that's up for debate as well. And Maldives is improving as well, but it's still, uh, not yellow or red is somewhere in between. So all red except for Bhutan and uh, Maldives. So uh, one of the um, pretty strong features of SDG 16 or SDG 16 plus is um, the human rights situation. South Asia is the only regional grouping in the world without any intergovernmental body on human rights. 
and anti-terrorism measures still being adopted in some South Asian countries, increasing uh, <coughs> incidents of human rights violation across the region. Uh, UPR recommendations, these are, these recommendations are in terms of human rights. So the more the, the more the number of recommendation, it looks pretty bad. So clearly you can see um, goal 16 is the most recommended goals under UPR. Um, I'll go into some details for this one. So, so, so this is the number of, uh, number of uh, received and accepted um, um, recommendations from the UPR. You can see these are uh, all are in high numbers. Um, Afghanistan is pretty high, 259 in 2019, which is the third phase of the UPR. 2000, even in 2014 is um, 224, but increased in 2029. Um, so I broke broken down the uh, recommendations and uh, you can see that uh, these are percentage of recommendations under goal 16 for South Asia. So 36% of the uh, recommendations for Afghanistan are under um, SDG 16, 32% for Bangladesh, Bhutan 20%, India 25%, Pakistan 41%, <clears throat> Maldives 26%, um, Nepal 32%, and uh, Sri Lanka are whopping 56% uh, of the recommendations um, under human rights um, are under goal 16. So under on goal 16, the following recommendations are the most common for South Asia. So optional protocol two of the international um, covenant on civil and political rights ICCPR related with the abolition prohibition of death penalty, except for Nepal as it doesn't have the death penalty. Other two recommendations include a ratification of the Rome statute and uh, on international criminal court, except for Bangladesh, Bhutan and Maldives, uh, promulgate and implement strict laws to address caste-based discrimination and take measures to effectively investigate in this regard, combat human trafficking. South Asia is a hub for human trafficking, not even one South Asian countries stand at Tier one countries doing enough to combat human trafficking under the US State Department's um, Trafficking in Person Report 2020, protect and promote the rights of vulnerable groups, including ethnic minorities, and assessment of the 1951 UN Convention relating to the status of refugee and 1967 protocol relating to the status of refugees. Other goals are under goal five, goal four, as well as goal eight. I won't go through all of the details. So our final analysis, uh, deteriorating human rights conditions in South Asia, lack of effective implementation of rule of law in different countries, human rights in South Asia clearly operating in a vacuum because of this reason, there's no um, regional human rights mechanism. There's a need for a human, South Asian human rights mechanism for the promotion and protection of human rights within the framework of SARC. But as we know, uh, due to uh, the protracted, uh, protracted uh, conflicts and relations amongst the countries of the region, SARC has largely been dysfunctional and effective, especially uh, in the last five years. So um, South Asia like, lacks a holistic rights based approach to socioeconomic reforms in all spheres. Underlying social economic realities in the region affect the implementation of rights-based um, rights -based approaches. For example, in the case of child labor, it is estimated that about 10% of children aged um, five to 17, um, sorry, aged, um, I think it's 10 to 17, um, or fine. Uh, are in under 17 anyway, are in full-time employment. Um, though all sub-regional sub countries have domestic laws and established um, principles prohibiting child labor, implementation con continues to be challenged. So there's a lot of uh, question about government's accountability. And um, this is also a prominent feature of SDG 16. This, um, the government is unable or is not willing to be accountable for its own laws. Um, and some of the updates are the fall of Afghanistan government to the Taliban is likely to lead to a large increases in civil um, deaths, 
and decrease um, in inclusive governance. Already famine is likely to hit the nation moving, uh, um, moving development even further in a negative direction. In many cases in the re region, uh, many problems are caused by structural issues and deep rooted system. Structural transformation or uprooting a deeply rooted system are necessary while promoting fair distribution of wealth and meaningful, meaningful uh, inclusion. While there are many deprived and marginalized social groups to attend to in South Asia, resources are inadequately allocated. Um, the implementation and management capacity of government agencies, especially at the subnational uh, subnational level, is a major concern. Children, youth, women, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and uh, queer, LGBTIQ, older people, the caste system, religious minorities, farmers, workers, indigenous groups, peoples with um, disabilities, uh, <clears throat> poor, um, face multiple forms uh, and dimensions of marginalization, uh, deprivation, and exclusion. Baseline and progress data are unavailable for many SDG indicators. Lack of data has made it impossible to track progress. Lack of disaggregated, uh, disaggregated data has affected transparency, accountability, and just distribution of resources and focus. So uh, just concluding, it is critical to bring uh, civil society community CSOs and academia together in planning, implementing, monitoring, and review process of the SDG goals and targets in the region. This is not only to tap uh, and mobilize resources and skills, but also to build ownership, co-contribute, find innovative solutions, and uh, generate um, sustainable outcomes in the region. Um, thank you. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. OK, thank you, Raj. Uh, Suget and Nurugul, would you mind sharing your PowerPoint in the chat box so that people can download and they compare before they make any comment? Uh, and also, uh, as I said, I put all the reference, the website, so that you can see the source of those uh, research. You know, this research, as you now understand, um, we are trying to look at SG16 as an entry point into the human rights framework. You know? As you know, we have a VNR, Voluntary National Review. We have a UPR, Universal Periodic Review. You know? But both as a, the cons and then, you know, the pros and cons, but those who went to New York to join this VNR process, many of them, especially civil society uh, friends, they are very frustrated, you know, because, you know, the VNR only 15 minutes, one five, one five, you know, each country, you know, so hardly any time to have a real dis substantive discussion, but relatively UPR has about three hours. So VNR provide a framework, but no time, but relatively, we can address many important issues in the UPR in terms of human rights. That's why as a Nurugul and also Suga said, we need to bring human rights-based approach to SDG. That's why we did the research about, you know, the in terms of human rights and 16 and SDG. You know? I hope you understand why we are doing this research as a way to promote human rights-based approach to SG 16. Uh, SDG as a whole, at the same time, SDG 16 plus approach with the human rights. Okay, so now we have uh, received the two reports, Central Asia, South Asia. Let's go to Southeast Asia, whether there's any difference among these three sub regions. Now, David from Asia Center, you have a 10 minutes again. The David, over to you. Okay, sure. Let me do. Okay, very good. Please go ahead. So, so I did a Oh, no, no, we cannot hear you now. Can you start again? To your mic problem, I guess. There's a network issue at David's end. I don't know. Sorry, we cannot hear you. OK, 
Okay, he's trying to fix. So while uh, waiting for his return, let me explain a little bit about the background of this research. As you know, uh, SDG and human rights, these are the two global norms and the framework which the civil society use for our advocacy purpose. But somehow, although they are addressing the common, uh, common issues on the ground, their approaches are very different. So a, that's why I said there's a pros and cons. So, but uh, relatively, the human rights um, in the, the international human rights community, especially within UN, they have developed the more sophisticated uh, mechanisms and procedures, which we can use, especially as a civil society. But when it comes to SDG, you know, there is uh, not much political space where we can make an impact as a result of our advocacy. That's why I said we have only uh, very little time in New York. And also there is no official process where we can put civil society report. So this is very much the government driven process. That's why we want to bring the human rights process, human rights procedure into the VNR so that we can secure more space and also we can have a real uh, impact on the VNR process. And the entry point is actually 16, you know? So you can use a human rights-based approach or you can also use the SG6, uh, SG 16 plus approach. So we have uh, different options, but at the end of the day, what we are trying to achieve is we promote human rights through SDG or we implement SDG through human rights-based approach. That way, human rights SDG is not, contra is, is not the conflicting, it's a mutually reinforcing, you know? So there was a purpose of this research. Now, David, uh, the connection problem. Is it David? Are you okay? Is it David? Are you coming back? Okay, uh, feel free to write down your comment and question about these two presentations. The one website, uh, the PowerPoint is available from Nurugul about Central Asia. As you can see, they are following the same format. So easy to understand, easy to compare, you know, South Asia and Central Asia, and also Southeast Asia too, because we use the same guideline for their research. And also, so you can see, you can download South Asia PowerPoint. And then you can compare, especially the implication and analysis, and then conclusion. Uh, seems uh, still has a problem. Or uh, Josna, is it okay we move to uh, session three? And then when the oh, David is coming back, yeah, he, he's coming back now. David, David are you okay? Can you hear me? Okay, now it's okay, David. Okay. okay. Sorry for that. No problem. Can let me share my screen again. Oh, not yet. Oh, now it's coming. Okay. Coming up, yep. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, very good. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so let me in, uh, in, in introduce myself quickly. I'm Ek Mong Khun. Uh, you, can, you can call me David. I'm from Asia Center. Uh, just to say, say again, uh, I, I will have two main points to make for this short presentation. Okay, so uh, Asia Center is a civil society research institute. We do three main things. We do evidence-based research. We can be activities and other uh, capacity building events. And we also do 
ad advocacy. Okay, so so let me first uh, uh, first start with my uh, with my first point, uh, which is uh, re re regarding the progress made by countries in the in the region uh, in terms of SDG. So in their VNRs, uh, mainly looking at SDG 16, the government has not been quite clear about what, what, what progress and what setbacks they face. They say that you know, there, there are some issues regarding human trafficking, regarding corruption, and, and the high level of domestic violence, and also the high poverty rate. But, but, but these issues lack a general context, meaning that uh, the countries do not say why this is happening or, or, or the fact that the government has failed to address this problem for a long time, or even in cases like corruption, it, 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 it should really be their own, it should really be their own fault. So, so with this in mind, uh, we we generally we generally see a region that is uh, not quite adamant about uh, improving SDG 16, which seeps into other progresses too. And and uh, uh, by, by by this I mean other types of SDGs. Uh, on on the other hand, uh, if if we look at civil civil society reports, uh, this this is the S SDSN. Uh, generally speaking, we have seen slight pro slight progress across all the SDGs uh, for all of the countries, even in Myanmar, where where although the coup has reduced the SDG uh, uh, scores, uh, especially for SDG 16 or SDG uh, 5 and such, the general score over the past five, six years has been improving. But the main point here is that, yes, it has been improving, but the rate of improvements is not enough. And, and as Jamila has said in the introduction, uh, Southeast Asia is currently not on track to reach any of the, uh, of, of the goals by 2030. And if we keep up the same speed, it would at least be 2065. So, 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 uh, so this will be the main issues. Uh, this, this graph shows that there are progresses made. Uh, you, you can see cases like uh, SDG goal number nine, where there are uh, uh, in improvements across the board, but uh, even in, in in SDG one to eight, you know, uh, one one to three to five, really really being a uh, a core part of 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 the wider SDG sixteen plus agenda, there are improvements, but these improvements are not good enough. We cannot say for now that. Uh, these improvements have been good in, in enough. Uh, yeah, so so this graph shows shows the same idea. Yes, there are improvements. We should commend uh, these countries uh, for showing uh, slight improvements, but these are not enough. And 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 civil society who work on S, who work on SDG and who work on human rights have to you know. Uh, uh, come, come, come to the understanding that uh, showing progress uh, really does not mean much if progress is not good enough. Okay, so so on to my second point. Uh, my, my my second point is is to look at how other countries through UBR to through the UBR mechanisms. Has has raised concerns in the region. Uh, this is uh, the top twenty uh, S SDG issues that are recommended. We can see that these are really mainly about SDG six uh, sixteen and also other uh, sorts of uh, 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 other sorts of SDG sub targets that is linked 
to the wider SDG 16 plus goal. Uh, you know, uh, for for example, this this would be a uh, goal uh, 8.7 to eradicate uh, forced labor. Goal goal 10.3 uh, 10 uh, on 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 uh, ensuring equal opportunity. So so uh, I will be showing you the uh, four main uh, types of recommendations that has been uh, uh, that has been observed. So the first will be the ones that are directly linked to the issues of uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions, which, which will be SDG 16. But then there's also issues regarding SDG 5, which is uh, mainly about gender equality, women empowerment, and the uh, inclusion of other gender minorities uh, in the public sphere. Then there is uh, SDG 10. And, and and also uh, SDG eight. Yeah, if 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 you look by countries, uh, right now I, I only have the six countries because this is the latest data from OACHR. But uh, looking at previous S, uh, looking at previous uh, UBR for other countries, uh, this is generally the trend. Uh, SDG sixteen would be the uh, biggest issues. And then would be you know as is uh, either as is a G ten five or four. So yeah, so uh, so uh, if we then look at how this is related to the SG plus issues, uh, we can see here that the main issues lies on the issues of ensuring peace and reducing all forms of violence. I think this is the first sort of SDG 16 plus uh, target, which is uh, around peace, around violence. Uh, you know, uh, the issue of violence, forced labor, uh, child uh, child labor even. And then, uh, all, all, although not quite to the same extent, uh, other countries has also, uh, also started to recommend uh, 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 these the Southeast Asian countries to improve themselves in terms of uh, having a more just society and 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 having a, a uh, having a society that's more inclusive of all types of people. So so generally is 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 the fact that other countries have seen that the issues of violence, the issues of, of peace in that sense is the most urgent issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, in, uh, in terms of ensuring the SDG 16 plus goal. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Could you please share the, you know, the implication and lesson learned? or conclusion in your research because you didn't have enough time to present but you can share still you know in the chat box together with your powerpoint so that participants can compare you know three sub regions central and south and southeast asia with city uh, presentation uh, unfortunately we do not have a time to have a q a and discussion but still you can you can write down your comments and also the question in the chat box and all the presenters will come back last session to respond to some of your questions. Okay, uh, let's move to the next session. We are a little bit behind the schedule. So now next session three, SC 16 plus and global. So now based on our own assessments of um, SC implementation in Asia, now we are going to discuss um, globally SC 16 in Asia, the first one, um, Ali Raja will introduce UN ESCA report and also UN Secretary General report. As you know, we have a two international report by UN, global one and the Asia. So he's going to address in terms of SG16+. And second one is, as you know, we have a HLPF, High Level Political Forum in New York, July. And before that, uh, civil societies, including Asia, uh, we met in Rome again, the, and then we produce Rome declaration about SC 16 plus. And John is in New York because of time difference. He's going to present through the video 
about uh, you know Rome decoration and also uh, what happened in the HLPF 2022 in terms of SG 16. Then third topic is our common agenda. As you know, UN Secretary General came up with a very strong report about um, the title, our common agenda uh, as a way to implement the, the, you know, the declaration of the 75th anniversary of UN. And then this year, we just concluded the Transforming Education Summit. And also next year, the UN is going to organize the Summit of the Future. So he, um, the Becky from uh, Coalition for UN, which is a new global campaign and more platform of CSOs to engage with the UN. She is going to introduce the key agenda of our common agenda. And lastly, but not least, you know, uh, two months time, we are going to have a COP26, um, the Egypt and also next year, Arab Emirates. So uh, UNFCCC, the AJ the co-chair of MGOS, also very much involved in this uh, climate justice issues. So we are going to have uh, four presentations in terms of SG16. So SG16 is not only the among ourselves, but we have to reach out to many other related issues uh, with a partner. That's why we have invited the four uh, speakers. So first, let me invite uh, Ali Raja uh, Jilani from APRCM. Are you in the room now? Yeah, I'm so long. Hi. Okay, please. Yep. You have about 10 minutes, please. All right, thank you. Uh, is my screen visible? Well, now we can see screen, yep. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so the first thing that I have uh, here is uh, courtesy to the UNESCO. Uh, 2022 uh, report on the Sustainable Development Goals progress in the Asia and the Pacific. Uh, now, this basically is a tracker in terms of where the region is in terms of in terms of the progress. And uh, as we see, you know, the marker at 2021 clearly indicates that we're not on track as a region on any of the goals. Uh, as far as the projected progress in 2021 is concerned. In terms of uh, the blurry lines that we see on goal five, goal 14, and goal 16 in particular, uh, we understand that the data is not sufficient across these uh, specific goals. And I'll talk about the specificity of indicators where we uh, especially have shortage of data. Uh, what's most concerning in this particular sheet is the goals on climate action, as well as those on responsible consumption and production patterns, where we're on the regressive trends. And you know the, the projected uh, situation that the report indicates uh, could be even worse compared to as it was in 2015, uh, by the time when we reach uh, 2030 which is uh, the, the target then. Uh, the other report that I have here is uh, concerning the SG's uh, report. So initially, let's go with the UNESCAP. We're, we're talking about regression on climate action and responsible consumption and production patterns. Uh, responsible consumption and production patterns, again, has those intersectional ties with goal 16, again, because it has to do with regulatory uh, measures at the national level in particular, in terms of corporate accountability. So there also like, you know, uh, there's, there's a sense of regression along those uh, indicators because of lack of uh, comprehensive accountability uh, frameworks, uh, weak regulatory mechanisms at the national levels. Then we have uh, the insufficient evidence on uh, gender, uh, the goal on life below water, and on peace and justice, which is 16. Now, in target terms, we're talking about 66% availability of data, meaning that the unknown is a humongous 34%. And when we speak in indicator terms specifically, we barely have sufficient data on 123 indicators, meaning barely 
So you have 47% in terms of indicators where we do not have sufficient data. And that is mainly due to the weakness of national statistical commissions in terms of, for instance, you know, in some, some places, uh, the data is being collected, uh, but you don't have the indicator production or its integration and reporting. And, and that is predominantly, I'll, I'll further explain also in, in 16's context, where we're in a lot of trouble as far as the data availability is concerned. Then the SDGs report 2022 from the Secretary General uh, reports uh, the highest number of conflicts since the creation of the UN. Uh, you know, the highest number of people at this point in time living in conflict zones, about a quarter of the global population, 2 billion people. Uh, it also highlights one of the uh, uh, flashpoints in terms of Goal 16, which is over 100 million people uh, forcibly displaced uh, from, from their communities. Uh, it also uh, alludes to cascading crises, uh, compounding further you know, vulnerabilities uh, in terms of access to several facilities and you know, uh, being uh, on the verge of uh, natural disasters and so on and so forth. And then uh, one, of the, one of the flashpoints again from this report also is the need for timely disaggregated and high quality data. Uh, and that is exactly where uh, civil society initiatives, uh, you know, I, I, I was amazed at some of the presentations that we shared in the previous session. Uh, also, some of the other initiatives coming from civil society will play a critical role in terms of understanding the multidimensionality of crises being lived by people uh, for us to be able to forge uh, holistic mechanisms in terms of, uh, you know, uh, recovery from COVID-19 vis-a-vis uh, the advancement of uh, SDG priorities. Now, one takeaway from that previous slide is the unknown, uh, which, which I want to focus here. So 34% in target terms and 47% in indicator terms. This particular projected uh, timeline that we have, that we're on, on the current rate of progress, we're going to be able to achieve uh, the SDGs by 2065, uh, could very well move into the 22nd century because we are not sure how the un unknown is going to look like. Once we have the uh, you know, sophisticated data architecture in front of us, and we have those indicators uh, being produced and, and we're able to analyze those, how are we going to stand at that point in time once we have uh, the unknown in front of us is also a serious question mark, and which is all the more what presses the need for uh, indicative data, complementary data coming from civil society. Uh, now, a specific uh, you know, uh, reflection from the UNESCO's report as far as Asia Pacific is concerned. Uh, so this is the tracker of the sort where you have uh, the green indicates um, barely one particular area where on the current rate of progress, uh, we, we will be in a position to meet the target. However, this effectiveness of institutions is yet to be unpacked. Uh, in conceptual terms. And then uh, the yellow that we have, the reduction of violence and related deaths, justice for all and corruption and bribery, et cetera, all of these indicate that we need to accelerate progress there. And the regressive trends that we have are on human trafficking, non-discriminatory laws, and uh, you know the most critical uh, areas where we're talking about illicit financial and arms flows, for instance, we have uh, no data available, which is uh, one of the uh, concerns that we uh, discussed in terms of Goal 16. Now, some of the some of the things that we need to uh, really uh, understand here in terms of Goal 16. Uh, when the framework came through and we had the uh, interagency expert groups uh, list of indicators, uh, we we do understand as civil society rep representatives that there were several pre-existing methodological as well as conceptual blank spots across uh, the entire framework and. Speaking specifically of uh, you know goal 16, for instance, uh, if one of the one of the uh, indicators requires you to say comply with the 27 core treaties of the UN in a specific country, and uh, in 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 support when you submit 273, uh, and I'm giving you a specific case, 273 federal and provincial laws uh, in in compliance if they are reported. That really does not, uh, you know, indicate uh, change or or 
that does not indicate the level of implementation against those 273 laws. So just the availability of laws is not going to be a reflection of the achievement of that particular target. And those are the sort of gaps that we have. So at the preliminary level, we don't, we don't even have data on, on things. And there's a need further to deepen uh, and, and uh, you know, bring out the quality of that data further, which is all the more uh, you know, that I'm trying to press where uh, civil society will have to support National Statistical Commission's capacity in terms of being able to uh, bring that data to life in terms of you know, a holistic understanding of issues and then the result. Um, as far as the current data is concerned, we, we have uh, most of these gaps across the entire framework in the Asia and Pacific. Goal 16 is the weakest in terms of availability of data. So we have uh, 13 indicators where uh, the data is insufficient and six where the data is uh, uh, just not available. Uh, at this point in time in 2023, uh, next year, uh, this is basically a crossroad in our 15 years and probably requires a sense of soul searching, uh, you know, in, in terms of the entire uh, multilateral mechanism. Uh, number one, uh, what, a few questions that I wanted to pose here. First will be consensus or critical considerations. We've been following, APRCM has been following ministerial uh, declaration uh, negotiations for the last few years. Uh, and it's always uh, consensus that is prioritized over critical considerations. And I think that that trend needs to reverse if we are to be able to uh, move ahead on this. The other is uh, systemic issues. Uh, are these only buzzworded abstractions or a key cross-cutting emphasis? Because uh, it really hasn't translated over the last few years uh, since we've been following the negotiations. Uh, goal 17 is merely reduced to partnerships alone. And that uh, is not going to resolve you know, some of the serious issues that have cross-sectional uh, ties, uh, you know, uh, literally uh, manifesting the success or failure of the entire framework. And then inclusive uh, multilateralism, where uh, we've raised time and again several issues in terms of uh, actors who have been historically part of the problem, they are given messiah status on the negotiation tables. So that pattern also has to change. And those who have been historically part of the solution, the civil society, uh, continue to face uh, exclusive uh, you know, patterns and, and restrictive patterns throughout uh, you know, this project. And quickly uh, moving to the conclusion, the 16 plus, how we uh, conceptualize it. Uh, the first uh, takeaway from, from uh, our understanding is that the IAG indicators list where although we are facing a lot of challenges in terms of uh, data availability to begin with, but a broader conception of that uh, is required in some sense, not just strategically, but also in, in geographic sense. For instance, on systemic issues, it will not be enough. Uh, you know, th there are several specific countries facing, uh, for instance, investor state dispute settlement issue. My country, Pakistan, faced uh, a $6 billion fine, for instance. So this issue is beyond the jurisdictional capacity of, a, of an individual country to be able to sort of, you know, do anything about it, right? So we, we need uh, regional mechanisms, basically, where, where we could try to resolve some of these, uh, uh, you know, systemic issues, including the illicit financial flows, uh, you know, militarism and conflict also in some sense, uh, corporate capture, authoritarian governance, and the shrinking civic spaces that we've been talking about in 16's context. So, 16 plus really requires a broader conception. And one of the core recommendations that we have is for uh, enacting a regional mechanism uh, to reform the taxation architect architecture, curb illicit financial flows, counter neoliberal instruments like uh, investor state dispute settlement, uh, protect spe uh, state policy space, and help with uh, inclusive technology facilitation mechanisms among others. And uh, lastly, uh, if, if we really mean this to be uh, inclusive multilateralism, uh, the naivety has to go away uh, across these negotiation processes, especially uh, the ministerial declaration. So there has to be that political leadership and will that needs to be galvanized uh, to see this as our collective uh, roadmap for, for future. And, and that would then you know, perhaps translate into efficient accountability on uh, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, uh, commitments, or those of official development assistance, you know, or um, perhaps you know, some solidarities that we can uh, create at the trans-regional level 
in terms of uh, uh, better uh, advancement on, on the SDG priorities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the institutionalized and meaningful civil society part participation across the planning implementation and review policies. So that's about it from my side. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ali Jinani. Very excellent uh, presentation, very informative and also very analytical. I think you gave a lot of food for thought and also analysis for our discussion. I think um, especially in terms of SG16, what are the, all the structural issues, so-called UN language systemic issues, you know? So thank you very much for enlightening us. Let's move to the next uh, presenter. So now we go to high-level political forum uh, and Rome Declaration. Uh, Josuna, are you going to present uh, recording, video recording? Or Joan, Joan yes. from CAP Network. Presenting his uh, recording. Oh, yes, please. Okay, I'm just sharing the screen. Okay, take time. All right, yeah, I see the Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Romano and I'm the coordinator of the TAP network. Um, TAP uh, is a global coalition of over 270 uh, CSOs from over 75 countries uh, working on SDG 16 plus on, on peaceful, just and, and inclusive societies uh, and on broader accountability for the 2030 agenda. Um, um, some of you may know us from some of our capacity strengthening resources, such as the SDG 16 plus uh, civil society toolkit, uh, the SDG accountability handbook, advocacy justice in the SDGs, uh, or, or a number of other uh, resources that we've put together over the years and work with many of you on. Um, you may also know us from our facilitation role with uh, for the Rome Civil Society Declaration on, on SDG 16 plus in which um, uh, Asia development. Okay, Oops, there is no sound. Josna, there is no sound. Yes, no speaker, there is no sound. We can't hear you. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, Josuna? Uh, I think, uh, can you can't hear? No, 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 no. Okay. Not at all? Minutes. Can you check the rest, whether still no sound? Can you go to the end of the video? No sound. No sound. Uh, so, this is a sound of silence. You can hear from your heart, not from your from ear. Okay can watch his face. You can read his <laughs> official presentation. <laughs> One mouth. <laughs> That's so... Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Josuna, you can check the whole video presentation, whether there is a, a caption, you know, the... Uh, my name is John Romano, okay. and I'm the can coordinator you... of the TAP yeah, network. Um, TAP uh, is a global coalition of over 270 uh, CSOs from over 75 countries uh, working on SDG 16 plus on, on peaceful, you? just, and, and inclusive societies. This part is okay. This part is okay. Later, yes. Agenda. Okay, no problem. Um, uh, I will share. Some of you may know us from some of our capacity me... strengthening resources, such as the. I will share the uh, his video presentation here so you can see it later, maybe. Uh, okay. You know, problem is we cannot hear the his message. 
So, you know, the uh, video presentation pre check whether there is a caption, only the, well, the text of his presentation. So, at least we can read the text of his presentation. All right. Sorry about the uh, technical problem. Um, so, we'll get back to you once we fix the problem. And then let's move to the next uh, speaker, the Becky Malay from Philippines, our old friends. And then, you know, she has a new title now. She has been very active in the GCAP, but now as an Asian uh, representative, she's now active in the global platform for Coalition for UN We Need. Uh, Becky, could you please introduce uh, C4UN and also the um, agenda of our common uh, our common agenda in terms of six and plus? You have also 10 minutes, please. Becky? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Anselmo, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Becky Malay. I come from the global call. To, I come from the Philippines, convener of the uh, global call to action against poverty, GCAP, Philippines, and uh, I'm now uh, working, um, not working, but part of the steering committee of the coalition for the UN we need. This was the, uh, this is the coalition that is actually monitoring what is happening at the United Nations uh, starting at the 20, in 2020 when we uh, celebrated the 75 years of the UN. So we're now actually, um, uh, involved uh, in, in monitoring what the UN has been doing in terms of the reforms. And uh, as you all know, the uh, OCA or the our common agenda report was uh, reported out by the UN Secretary General. Uh, the OCA is actually a report uh, that is meant to turbocharge the implementation of uh, the SDGs and, of course, the Agenda 2030. As we all know, uh, our timeline for Agenda 2030, as already studied well by ESCAP and the UN agencies, uh, is actually um, the goals we will not be able to to uh, reach until 2065. So at least we have to have an acceleration of these processes. And I'm sure we will be able to uh, progress only if we recognize and have a full analysis of what our problems are. No? Uh, are the civil society inputs uh, in, in the researches that you presented earlier are very, very important because these are the starting points again, because we need to reboot and restart. No? Uh, I was asked also to speak about uh, the issues uh, in the or the outcomes of the transforming the edu education summit, which happened uh, recently. And uh, the reality is that 147 million students have missed the in-person uh, instructions no? and are missing still the uh, in-person structure instruction um, uh, learning uh, since 2020. So 244 million children are out of school. 90% of the world's children are out of school and uh, are not able to do face-to-face -face instructions because of huge uh, cuts in budgets in the national budgets of different countries. And then 50% of all countries have actually cut their budgets on education. So we see that globally 64.3 percent of children are actually unable to read and comprehend so what we are talking about simple sentences simple stories 64.3 percent of children all over the world uh age from um age zero from age uh, five to about 10 years old will not be able to read and comprehend. Do you know that in the Philippines, the setback for us was actually uh, 90%. So it's huge, despite the fact that the Philippines is supposed to be spending uh, the highest budget, the highest expenditures for uh, education uh, as a constitutional mandate. So 840 million young people leave school without will will leave school without being qualified uh, for any uh, uh, jobs in the in the future so this is actually translating to about 10 trillion us dollars losses in earnings potential earnings of these young people so we have actually uh, reached a point 
where the COVID-19 impacts have been so great that it needs a reboot. Uh, we need to reboot in terms of uh, not only the SDGs, but also in the supposed to be enabler for, for our progress in sustainable development, which is education. This is horrifying to, to, to see because the future generations that we are talking about will not be able to cope with the kind of uh, drawbacks, especially uh, the poor, where um, basic education as, as of this point has been deprived. No? So this is terrible uh, news. And uh, in the summit of, uh, in, in the uh, Transforming Education Summit, the youth uh, actually uh, uh, gave a, a very uh, strong declaration on transforming education. Uh, mainly the call is for, for decision makers to recognize and invest in non-formal education programs and organizations, particularly those that are youth-led. And then they're also looking uh, especially to urge decision makers to strategically invest in green and digital skills, policies and strategies to enhance education, research, entrepreneurial opportunities, and decent jobs for youth. And then they're also calling for decision makers to put in place recruitment mechanisms for teachers because it's not only the young people, the learners that are sacrifice uh, that are uh, you know uh, doing a lot of um, uh, facing a lot of challenges, but uh, the teachers have been facing a lot of sacrifices in terms of the learning um, um, methodologies that they have to adapt because uh, of the lack of. Uh, uh, concern for by governments for education at this point no? so we um, the youth um, are actually uh, you know have presented this in the transforming education summit you can see the whole declaration uh, in the um website i will share i will share it later uh, for brevity and then i'd like to go to uh, the summit of the future which is which was actually uh, supposed to be happening in September 2023, but now moved to September 2024. No? Uh, the Summit of the Future, as of this point, uh, is scheduled uh, to happen on 23 and 24, uh, 22 and 23 September in 2024. Uh, what is going to happen in the Summit of the Future is that there will be um, uh, some declarations that are being uh, opened up, I mean, um, decided. First, uh, we are expecting a new agenda for peace. And then we are also expecting as one of the outcomes and the outputs, a global digital compact based on the shared principles of open, free and secure digital future. Third, a declaration on future generations. And then also a declaration on the emergency platform. And then also some um, declaration or agreement, sorry, on uh, outer space, because uh, there needs to be a political agreement on the peaceful, secure, and sustainable use of uh, outer space. And then uh, we are also talking about more effective multilateral arrangements, no? because this is the time for multilateralism that should be effective and based on solidarity. So these are the outcome will be the pact for the future, but uh, there is a problem in terms of the kinds of modalities that are being negotiated right now. There was a resolution that came out uh, defining the modalities for the summit of the future as facilitated by New Zealand and Oman. But as you can see, we are not privy to the negotiations that are actually going on because they are backdoor and that's not very open to civil society. So we have been demanding our presence in, in uh, determining the modalities. But since the resolution has come out, I would like to share some concerning um, uh, uh, sections uh, of uh, the resolution because 
while we have been asking us for wider civil society participation, actually looking for the establishment of an office of civil society in the office of the uh, Secretary General and, uh, and demanding all our uh, multi-stakeholder consultations to be really broad and uh, very effective. What happened is that in the resolution that came out, there is section 11, which says, the president of the General Assembly will draw up a list of representatives of other relevant NGOs, CSOs, academic institutions, and the private sector who may participate in the high-level summit of the future taking into account the principles of transparency, geographical representation, et cetera, et cetera, but with due regard for, uh, 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 no, for uh, to submit the proposed list to member states for their consideration on a non-objection basis and to bring the list to the attention of the assembly for final decision by the assembly on participation in the summit. So in other words, we will still be subjected to a lot of restrictions in terms of participation. And uh, it gives the member states the right to quietly and uh, uh, bar uh, the, the presence of uh, CSOs and NGOs. So this is still a struggle. So um, those are the words that we don't really want to happen. Oh, those are the situations where we really don't want this to happen, but uh, we're struggling on it. But nevertheless, um, these are what we have been trying to monitor at the C4UN. So we will keep you in touch because our campaigns will really uh, force the UN to be more open and let us participate in all of the processes that are needed, uh, that are needing civil society voices, uh, such as uh, uh, this summit, uh, the Pact for the Future. So uh, everything is fluid and everything is still, um, ongoing so we will keep you in touch you can visit our website at c4wn wun for uh, updates and your participation everyone is welcome so i'll end my presentation here on selma thank you hey thank you becky uh for your very informative uh presentation sharing could you please share uh, your talking point or especially the key agenda of the summit of the uh future as you said, you know, this uh, summit has been postponed to 2024 from 2023. That means we have a little bit more time to prepare. I think this can be very, very important because basically summit of the future in my understanding, you know, all the important issues which are not part of SDG, you know, now they're put in the name of summit of the future. And so I think this can be another important uh, opportunity for our advocacy. So let's make use of uh, this opportunity. That's the reason that we introduce uh, this uh, agenda for new summit of the future. Thank you for your sharing. I also put some of the relevant website and the link while listening to you in the chat box. So those who are not familiar with the coalition for the UN and also this uh, summit, you can check this website. So now, uh, before... and Selma, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I've got the video from Jotsna. Shall I try and uh, see if we can play it now? Uh, the, the, you already fixed the uh, John. Are, are you uh, saying? No. I've, I've got the video from Jotsna. Uh, shall I try and play it now? Uh, uh, which, maybe what? after. Uh, sorry, Anselma, maybe after Deirdre and Ajay's uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, let me invite Deirdre. Uh, Jotsna, can you fix the, this? Pro I don't know. I don't understand. You know what is. No, no, I sent the video to Dipanshu. Thank you, Dipanshu. I'll just message you. Okay. So now. Um, I, I'd like to invite uh, Diadra from Foros International. As you know, ADA is a regional partner of Foros. The like APSD is a regional partner of Action for Sustainable Development. The Foros has been engaging all the important SG6 related issues. So I think it's very uh, good to have her. So thank you for joining us uh, real time from Europe. It's a very challenging time for you. Could you please share your idea? how you have been working on FC16 Plus and also how we as a civil society in Asia can work with you and uh, contribute more effectively. You have about 10 minutes, please, Diadra. 
Thanks very much, Anselmo, and hello, everybody. And um, thank you for the invitation to speak here today as part of this uh, Asian Regional Forum on SDG 16 plus. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Forus, we're a global network of 68 national NGO platforms and seven regional coalitions from all continents. And we're led by our members who are deeply involved in monitoring and implementing the 2030 Agenda's Sustainable Development Goals. And we have a particular focus in our advocacy work within Forus on SDG 16 and SDG 17. So it's SDG 16 plus that I'm going to speak about today, particularly in the context of the upcoming or the, the uh, presently occurring uh, UNGA, United Nations General Assembly and the SDG Summit. And really, I'm going to look at what can civil society do in terms of effective advocacy around uh, SDG 16 plus, because as I'm going to argue here, it's a very important goal. It's, it's a foundational and what we would call a transversal goal. And it is essentially um, its realization. The realization of SDG 16 plus is a precondition really for the achievement of all of the other SDGs. So um, just speaking briefly then about the UNGA and the SDG Summit. Um, so UNGA 2022, as we know, is happening at the moment. Um, and it's really important that civil society everywhere, but particularly CSOs in Africa, seize these international moments to insist that the commitments that their governments made in relation to SDG 16 when they adopted the 2030 agenda must be fully delivered on. So in other words, civil society um, must be targeted or civil society must target heads of states, ministers and civil servants in the during the United Nations General Assembly and the SDG summit, which will take place as far as I'm aware at the moment in 2023. I don't think Anselmo that that's changed uh, to 2024 as the summit of the future has but maybe somebody else has more up-to-date information on that. But um, the uh, General Assembly is taking place, as we know, between September the 13th and the 27th this year. Its theme is a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges. And the UN UNGA meets, as we're aware, when uh, as complex overlapping crises unfold around the world, food insecurity is looming, humanitarian needs are deepening, climate goals remain largely unmet, inequality is worsening. And so there's very high expectations for the UNGA for diplomacy to work um, because there's a need for unprecedented and urgent global cooperation and that becomes clearer by the day. The SDG summit then is supposed to happen as I know Becky has referred to it already in 2023 officially and these summits take place every four years so this SDG summit in 2023 will be the second since the 2030 agenda was adopted and importantly it will be a midpoint review of the implementation of the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals and along with the summit of the future that Becky has referred to already it's one of the twin summits uh, that is planned um, over the coming two years years. So SDG 16 plus, as we know, um, is not just the concept of SDG 16 on its own. We believe and, and, and the authors of um, the Agenda 2030 were very clear that it shouldn't be seen in isolation. It has very strong links with other goals in line with the integrated and indivisible nature of the Agenda 2030. And that is why we speak. And I know Ad is very committed to speaking about SDG 16 plus and not just SDG 16. So um, in terms of, of uh, the uh, advocacy around the uh, SDG 16, so this SDG 16, as we know, focuses to a large extent on issues of governance, and it aims to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all level. So this is a goal that has profound implications for civic spaces around the world, but particularly in Asia. And we know in recent years, there have been many um, crises around governance and civic space in countries like Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Hong Kong, and so on. And the freedom to exercise civil and political rights is extremely important for civil society as it struggles to fulfill the role mandated to it by the 2030 agenda. And ADA and Forrest collaborated a few years ago on a report which uh, really sets out how SDG 16 can provide important leverage for civil society everywhere in its attempts to create and to defend civic space and to be more effective in monitoring and implementing the 2030 agenda.
So one of the first things that I'm going to suggest today that Asian civil society should do, particularly around the, the UNGA and the SDG summit next year, is to call for SDG 16 to be reviewed by the UN High Level Political Forum every year in the same way that SDG 17 is reviewed every year. So this would serve not just to keep issues of civic space, the exercise of fundamental freedoms and the promotion of human rights high on the international political agenda on an ongoing basis, but it would also help wider issues of governance, justice, peace and security to be discussed regularly. So civil society needs to make the annual review of SDG 16 plus a rallying call, which it targets at the UN member states during the UNGA and at the upcoming SDG summit next year. So the other issue that I think Asian civil society should really be advocating around are SDG 16 related civic space indicators. So target 1610 of SDG 16 commits the UN member states to ensure access to public information and protect fundamental freedoms. But despite the clear aim of this target, the two global level indicators to assess progress on these um, aims do not adequately measure the extent to which these freedoms and particularly freedom of association association, expression and assembly, which are fundamental freedoms, the extent to which they're being protected. So the first indicator, it's a global indicator um, linking to SDG 1610 covers, and I'll quote, the number of verified cases of killing, kidnapping, enforced disappearance, arbitrary detention and torture of journalists, associated media personnel, trade unionists and human rights advocates in the previous 12 months. And the second global indicator, existing global indicator counts uh, I quote, the number of countries that adopt and implement constitutional, statutory and or policy guarantees for public access to information. But these indicators, I would, Forrest would argue, are outcome indicators, and they focus primarily on violations of the rights to bodily integrity and life, but they don't directly measure how much are freedoms of association, assembly and expression protected in day-to-day -day civic life. And in particular, these indicators need to be complemented by the development and the adoption of other relevant structural and process-related civic space indicators. For example, a possible structural civic space indicator would be, for example, the existence and coverage of domestic laws protecting the rights to freedom of association, assembly and expression. And for example, a process-oriented civic space indicator could be the proportion of received complaints on the rights to freedom of expression, association and assembly invested and adjudicated by courts or other competent national mechanisms in the last 12 months. So these indicators could be adopted uh, at the global level to accompany the existing output indicators, but they could also subsequently be adopted at a national level where specific gaps or challenges relating to civic space have been identified. So what I'm calling here for today is for uh, civil society and particularly Asian civil society, as, as I know that's the focus of the, the event here today, to call for an expanded range of SDG 16 plus related civic space indicators. And they must, uh, these new civic space indicators should look at the extent to which citizens can exercise the rights to freedom of association, assembly and expression in their communities and societies, and in accordance with international human rights standards and national human rights laws. And in this uh, respect, the OHCHR, the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, UNESCO and the International Labour Organization, because these are official custodians for Target 1610, civil society and other key stakeholders need to engage with these organize Organizations to participate in the process of developing better indicators and better data collection for SDG 16 plus. And along with these civic space indicators, there's also a need for civil society to address the significant data gap in SDG 16 related monitoring of what are called governance systems. So there is a growing and unfulfilled need for official statistics linked not only to the measurement of civic space, but also to the measurement of governance. And that is issues like inclusion, civic participation, rule of law, access to information. So at the end of the first cycle of implementation of the 2030 agenda in 2019, 
very few countries and statistical offices had successfully produced governance data to report on progress with SDG 16. So there's been a clear failure to use data and information from other relevant uh, reporting processes, such as human rights mechanisms like the UPR process, to report on progress with SDG 16 plus implementation. Um, could I have my third slide, please, uh, Justin? Sorry, I, I know you're helping me to change my slides there. So on the third slide, I'm talking about monitoring civic space in voluntary national reviews. And this is very important because since 2016, VNR or voluntary national review reports submitted by national governments each year to the United Nations High Level Political Forum have been largely silent on the issue of civic space. And this gap in the VNR reports is particularly concerning particularly given the trend, the increasing trend of closing civic space around the world. And this is also despite increasing calls for action by civil society organizations and others around the world to address the deteriorating human rights situation in many countries and to protect human rights defenders and environmentalists. So national government's official response uh, has actually worsened largely due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been used as an excuse by some governments to further close civic space. So what I'm proposing here today that um, that uh, civil society and particularly Asian civil society should focus on in terms of the advocacy it directs at UNGA and at the SDG summit is that national governments should report on civic space issues in the VNRs they submit to the UN high level political forum. And we're also, um, and for us have been strong in pushing this idea that governments should engage in peer exchange with other governments to share good practices on civic space issues. And then on to my final point here, which is about civil society shadow or parallel reports. So civil society shadow and parallel reports provide important information amongst other issues on how civic space is being closed in different countries. However, as we know, these reports are not included in the formal presentation of VNRs at the high level political forum. And they currently have no status in official VNR review processes at either the national, regional or international level. So again, we're proposing here today that uh, Asian civil society and civil society more generally um, do advocate for civil society shadow or spotlight reports to be given more prominence in the UN high level political forum VNR processes, and that these reports should be made available to download from the UN website. We also have called for funding for CSO capacity development to support civil society organizations to develop their abilities to prepare high quality and well researched CSO shadow reports or parallel reports parallel reports to disseminate during the UN high level political forum. So I think my uh, speaking time is up now, Chair, but um, I'd like to obviously uh, take any questions or comments later, but back to you uh, for the moment. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Diadra. Again, very excellent, high quality presentation, very informative and insight, and also very practical. You know, you gave us very important point for our advocacy, especially the annual agenda, make SECs in annual agenda, and also, um, you know, the 1610, the SEC related civic space, or another committee we call enabling environment, but basically the same, you know, same issues. So, uh, 1610 access to information and also fundamental freedom which has a foundation of all our civil society activities which are really critical issue now today in asia you know so thank you for enlightening us again how we can more actively use uh, this uh vienna and also upr so now let me ask uh, josna is the video uh jones video presentation ready if not uh, let me invite uh, the the uh, Ajay from MGO's co-chair, because um, the other I mentioned about not only human rights defender, but environmentalists, or in other words, human, environmental human rights defender, they are facing a lot of threat, the life threat, because, you know, they are really challenging the big corporations, and they are trying to implement SDGs, especially the climate and then all the environmental related goals, but result is the death threat, you know. So, um, so now I'd like to invite Ajay to update us about what's happening now, the climate crisis, especially the uh, SDG 13 and also Paris climate 
uh, uh, convention and also the negotiation now. You know. so Ajay, are you ready? Okay, good to see you again. So you have again though, about 10 minutes. Yeah, good to see you and Selma. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, 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 I'm traveling with weak Wi-Fi connection. So I would prefer to keep my video off so that there is no, uh, I mean, there are lesser chances of any disruption. Uh, starting from the point where Daidre left and you also picked it up in your follow-up, uh, SDG review every year. This was discussed in the ECOSOC and HL, uh, ECOSOC reforms and HLPF reforms uh, last year, but majority of the countries uh, decided against it. And no country, as a matter of fact, no country wants to review its human rights situation. So that's the sad news. Uh, but definitely, it's it's uh, an important matter for all of us, and we should uh, uh, continue to try to keep this on the agenda as long as we can do, and as strongly as we can do. So, uh, with regard to my presentation, I have been asked to 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 talk about how we are moving towards uh, COP twenty seven, which will happen in November in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt and uh, also towards the next COP, which will happen in UAE. Uh, as far as UAE COP is concerned, I mean, things will be decided only after this COP, as far as uh, the negotiations track, tracks are concerned. But I'll just give you a few pointers for people to understand how we are moving towards COP27 and what has happened since last year in COP26. COP26, UK government and uh, uh, president touted a lot about uh, reviving the 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius target and keeping it alive. And uh, uh, as you, as some of you might remember, that UNEP uh, in its emission gap report highlighted that even after the the revised NDCs that have been submitted and commitments that have been made at uh, COP26 we are still at the danger of rising temperature from say 1.8 uh, degrees to 2.7 degrees uh, by the end of the century against the Glasgow commitment to keep the rise in temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And uh, the COP26 also invited all the countries in the light of insufficiency of their national determine contributions to revise their NDCs, update their NDCs. And till today, only 17 countries have updated their nationally determined contributions. And these 17 countries include majority of the very small countries, only three, two, three big countries like, uh, like Australia, Egypt, Brazil, et cetera, have revised their, revised their NDCs. But there is no such revision in the ambition on how they will increase their, in, I mean, reduce their emissions. And uh, this, is, this is very problematic because we see that uh, uh, a World Meteorological Organization report early this year said that we are now at 50% chance of 1.5 degrees Celsius target being breached within just next three years. And this possibility was 0% in 2015. So one can understand that how fast we are hurtling towards the crisis. While we are supposed to reduce global emissions by 43% by 2030, uh, as a matter of fact, as, as far as the projections show at the current pace, we are increasing uh, emissions by 16% by 2030, rather than reducing it by 43%. So I think it's a very uh, problematic scenario for all of us. We are seeing already seeing the impacts of climate change. And uh, this year also, this year has been remarkable in terms of reminding people and also uh, rich industrialized countries to, 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 to improve their contributions towards emission re reduction by bringing, say, huge heat waves all across the world from, say, China to Australia, uh, 
Spain and Portugal, more than 1,700 people died just in two weeks. I mean, uh, uh, half of the US states, people are experiencing unprecedented heat waves. UK experienced uh, temperatures of 40 degrees above for the first time in the history. Half of the Eurozone is under the threat of the, uh, of the drought. And uh, not to forget Pakistan uh, floods that we have seen just recently, more than 33 billion people, uh, uh, 33 million people have been uh, affected. And uh, the loss and damage has been say to the scale of more than US $40 billion. Uh, so now we are at the precipice of the danger of uh, 2.7 degrees Celsius rise in temperature by the end of the centuries. And that too, only when all the countries keep their promises, which, uh, which, 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 which we are very doubtful about. Uh, talking about the promises, G20 countries, which contribute uh, to 80% of the global emissions they promised in 2009 that they will phase out the in, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, uh, but uh, they have uh, completely and squarely failed in keeping up their promises. I mean, if I look at the uh, fossil fuel subsidies since Paris Agreement, rather than reducing, many countries have in, increased their fossil fuel subsidies and not by small amounts or margins, by huge margins. If you look at Australia, Australia has increased its uh, fossil fuel subsidies by 48% since uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, Canada has uh, increased fossil fuel subsidies by 40% and the uh, US has increased fossil fuel subsidies uh, by 37% since the Paris Agreement. Uh, as, as we know, the direct fossil fuel subsidy of say 500 billions are given every year, every year. And since Paris, this, uh, this number has reduced very by a very fraction, fractional amount. Uh, in 2022, the uh, fossil fuel subsidy stood at 472 billion US dollars. So we can see that uh, rather than reducing or phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, many countries, uh, it's not only Australia, Canada, US, but Indonesia, France, China, Brazil, all of them have increased fossil fuel subsidies and not to forget countries like China, Saudi, uh, Brazil, India, these only these three, four, five countries uh, compose 50% of the fossil fuel subsidies. And uh, it's a no-brainer to say that a lion's share of these uh, subsidies go to the companies rather than to the consumers. And uh, if anybody wants to understand, I mentioned only 500 billion US dollars in subsidies. But if you look at the externalities and include the environmental and climate cost into the subsidies, the figure goes to a whopping $5.9 trillion in 2020 alone. And this is not my calculation. This is from a recent IMF report, which says that fossil fuel subsidies cost us $5.9 trillion in 2020 alone. Uh, secondly, I would come to, I would talk uh, briefly about the market-based mechanism, which is the favorite subterfuge of the rich and industrialized countries. And they say that this is the biggest or single most important solution in reducing emissions. So if we try to look at how much coverage these market-based mechanism and carbon pricing has done in Industrialized, country, industrialized countries, uh, of course, uh, EU countries are in a better position and countries like France and Germany have uh, covered more than 80% of their emissions under these schemes. Uh, but uh, countries like UK, they have only 31% carbon emissions under these schemes. And uh, 
US, United States of America, who was the one uh, who put market-based mechanism in the, uh, in the Kyoto Protocol, they have only 5% carbon emissions covered under their market mechanism. And one would expect that if they say that this is an important mechanism to reduce uh, carbon emissions, it should be priced adequately. If you look at the prices, uh, in UK, the price is uh, around $58 per ton of carbon. But you, if you look at US, the price of one ton of carbon is as low as $6 per ton. So that sort of gives us an indication that how the market-based mechanism, which have sort of kept the Paris Agreement captive for so many, uh, so long and also Kyoto Protocol are doing in terms of uh, emission reduction. Uh, as far as as far as tracks of negotiation or what to expect at uh, uh, expect at COP twenty seven is concerned, uh, I mean although there are more than twenty topics of dialogues and more than tens of meetings takes place all the time in these kinds of meeting, but I would like to focus on four major areas which are which are concern uh, for uh, all of us rather not only developing countries but primarily developing countries. Uh, if we talk about how countries are going about increasing their ambition in reducing, reducing the emissions, the, uh, the Glasgow uh, COP set up a work program on ambition and implementation. And uh, this is supposed to, this is supposed to enhance ambition in countries efforts before 2030 but there are few key areas which there are a huge convergence between the developed countries and developing countries like what should be the time period whether countries should uh, give commitments uh, in each of the sector or, or on the sectoral basis uh, how to frame the language on accountability in the work program uh, I mean, in the bond meeting late uh, uh, recently, uh, there was a suggestion that uh, one should put the language something like big emitters with capability who will have more responsibility, but that was rejected by uh, rich and industrialized countries. So there are a lot of differences over the language, over timing, over uh, over coverage of the work program on ambition. Uh, uh, ambition, we are likely to have some pre-COP27 workshops where it is aimed to be finalized and finally to be adopted. I mean, the work methods, working methods will be adopted at COP27. Uh, uh, in terms of adaptation, I mean, it's of primary concern for the developing countries and they have been uh, asking to scale up discussion on ambition in the COPs also, uh, which was recognized in the Paris Agreement where Article 7 said that uh, uh, we should try to have a global goal on adaptation. Uh, global goal and adaptation, but in the last six years, 2015 since Paris Agreement, there has been no work done on the global goal on, on adaptation. There is no clarity on the definition. There is no clarity on the working methods and what we expect uh, as an outcome. I mean, global goal, Paris Agreement only defines global goal on adaptation as a process to enhance adaptive capacity, reduce, uh, uh, improve resilience and reduce vulnerabilities. But beyond that, we don't have much clarity on how it will take place. So this is also uh, likely to be an important uh, uh, agenda on the, on the agenda of the COP27. Uh, about finance, finance is definitely one of the most important uh, points of discussion in the COP uh, and also beyond COPs. I mean, uh, since last, since last uh, COP, there has been technical experts dialogue on new 
quantified collective goal on finance, which will be a sort of base, base amount uh, beyond 2030, which developed countries will try to mobilize, like $100 billion they committed in, uh, uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, uh, so two expert dialogues have already taken place and experts uh, have highlighted the increasing need for climate finance. Uh, for example, experts highlighted that for only for mitigation, three times to six times of the current support will be required up to 2030. In terms of absolute numbers, the Standing Committee of Finance calculates that five to eleven trillion dollars will be required up to 2030, which is only 30 percent of the overall needs of the developing countries. Uh, as all of you know, that we are quite struggling to achieve only. $100 billion uh, floor since Copenhagen. That has uh, not been done yet. Uh, and uh, developed countries uh, uh, sort of most, uh, most, most uh, often said argument is that we don't have that much of, uh, that much of money. But uh, as it turns out, if it is not true. If you see, uh, a fiscal, fiscal, what do you uh, say? Fiscal response measures of the value of sixteen point seven trillion dollars were raised during the COVID pandemic. Of course, majority of it came from developed countries where they were able to uh, help people with social security. Say about half of their population. But when you look at developing countries, they could help only 1% of the population uh, through this uh, fish, fiscal, fiscal measures. Uh, uh, uh. And actually, this brings us to the, dis to the point of the discussion. Uh, sorry, Ajay, Ajay, uh, sorry uh, we are already behind the schedule. Can you wind up, uh, wrap up your... Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just winding up that... Uh, as of now, and likely to remain in two, three years, if there are no, not uh, very effective efforts towards debt resolution and restructuring, there is no possibility that developing countries can improve their, their ambition towards, uh, towards, uh, towards uh, achieving Paris uh, Agreement goals. But more important or rather equally important is the civil society participation in these kind of meetings and especially at UN spaces. We have seen that the quota allotted for participation to NGOs is being reduced every year. Now it's almost impossible to hold a side event at any of the COPs because they will ask you to merge your events with at least four or five organizations, which not many can do. And even for people who can do it, I mean, you are not, you are not very successful in delivering a very clear and concrete message because of the participation of the several organizations. Uh, as far as holding any kind of action or protest is concerned, Egypt, you can uh, hold these kind of actions only within the venue of the COP27 and with the permission of the organizers. You can't hold these kind of actions outside as of now the position is. And as far as providing other facilities to the COP participants are concerned, we have been told that the government of Egypt have asked all the hotels, this, this was two months back, to cancel all the reservations that were done for COP27, and they have imposed a new rate of say $120 per night per person to have this hotel reservations. Our reservations also have been canceled many times and uh, 
uh, we are still looking for some cheap accommodation. And if you have some, if anybody is going to the co-op and you have some idea of uh, uh, having this kind of facility, uh, there are no human hotels in uh, Sharmal Sheikh also, places like Sharmal Sheikh, which is highly securitized. So you will be helping a lot of people if you share information about the cost-effective accommodation also. So thank you so much. I would stop here. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, otherwise, I'll have to leave in, say, 10 minutes because I'm in another meeting right now. Yeah. Uh, Ajay, thank you also again for very uh, informative, insightful, and also very practical sharing a real problem we are facing in the COP27. Could you please put down your email address so that people can approach you in case because we don't have time for Q&A, you know, all the sessions. So those who presenter, please leave your email address so the participant uh, can uh, approach you if necessary. And also, as we promised, uh, Josna will collect all the presentation and then send to you. But if you want to receive uh, individually, please leave your email address so that we can send directly to your email all the PowerPoint uh, compilations. So now we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, last session four is uh, input into the declaration 2022 and also the takeaway. You know? So I'd like to invite all the presenters of, from session one to share uh, your takeaway. You know? What is the most important message or takeaway for you, uh, which can be into the declaration, but also uh, it's a sharing, you know, uh, kind of reflection after very informative and useful input. And as I want to highlight, as Ajay explained, you know, because we are talking about FC16, but now we are adding climate because we have a lot of silo or fragmentation. You know, people used to say, which SDG are you working? Oh, I'm working at CG 13 climate. Oh, you are working 16 human rights, you know? So I think we need to really have a so-called the nexus approach, which means what about human rights-based approach to climate or SDG 16 plus approach to climate? You know? As Ajay said, at the end of the day, we are losing our space, political space in uh, climate negotiation. That means it's a SDG 16 issue. You know? So we need to link SDG 16 to very substantive the challenges like a climate and many others. That's why we are trying to promote SG16 and also the Diadra stress very much XG16 and 17 together, you know. So that SG16 17 always we need to remember whichever issue we are addressing, especially today, we want to stress uh, uh, 13 climate, which is the greatest challenge and threat to humanity today, you know, as we experience in the Pakistan, you know. It's not Pakistan today. But it can be any other country next year, you know. Okay, so let me invite uh, presenters from session one. We have a use voices. If you still stay here, can you please share the one minute each? One minute each. Whether presenters speak, uh, participant, I will give the one minute. Please uh, indicate your intention to speak with a yellow. You know this uh, uh, icon, yellow, and then I'll give a flow to those who make a yellow. You know. Okay, any use uh, speaker from session one? If not, I'll move to session two. Uh, Suget, Nurugel, and David would you like to share after listening to all other presentation. One minute takeaway. Let's begin with the Nurugel from Central Asia. Actually, I already shared my recommendations in the presentations, but I would like to strengthen a couple of things. I think it would be very good to strengthen the, the solidarity uh, cooperation, the solidarity for the human rights approach, and also to come up with the regional mechanisms for human rights monitoring. I think it would be very good also to start integrating and much more cooperation between human rights organizations in all regions and are any other working against poverty or against on climate uh, climate change, for example, so that that 
could give us a very concrete indicators on how to integrate human rights approach to a particular goal. Yep. And that requires maybe discussing and coming up with a very specific mechanism of cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, human rights based approach to specific issues, it can be climate, you know, because there's huge human rights violation in Pakistan because of uh, climate. And that's why we need to bring human rights based approach to climate and also uh, many other. Okay, so thank you very much. Now uh, let's go to the Suget, the presenters of session two. It's a one minute takeaway, Suget, please. Oh, thank you, Anselmo. Uh, um, I I'm, I'm just wanted to talk about the human rights approach. I mean, the SDGs were envisioned from a human rights uh, approach perspective when they were first designed and uh, impl I mean, um, implemented or, um, and um, you know, the climate comes, I mean, we have to sort of uh, be clear on what, how in our regions, how me in so many multiple ways our human rights are being violated. Um, I mean, inaction in climate, um, there's corruption, there's a, uh, you know, okay. false uh, Take away, only take away, please. Keep ah, right. position. Okay. Um, just that, um, you know, um, climate change has um, degraded the human rights situation in South Asia, and then uh, we need to integrate climate change as uh, as an important aspect of the human rights approach. Thank you. And so okay. More. So again, you highlight the human rights based approach to climate as a concrete case. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is David still around? David from Asia Center. Uh, if not, let's move to the Ali Raja from APRCM. Yeah, thanks, Anselmo. Uh, the, the key takeaway for me would be uh, the idea of uh, civil society collaborations to uh, produce analysis which goes beyond goals under review uh, approach. And that's exactly where I mean, uh, you know, the intersectional ties across different goals. Uh, vis a vis uh, you know, a uh, central emphasis on uh, where we have the blank spots, which is basically uh, your systemic issues. So we need to produce uh, that kind of analysis. We need to uh, come up with that, that sort of a narrative, uh, which informs global policymaking and deliberative processes moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for highlighting once again importance of intersectionality. You know, there are many uh, the languages about this intersectionality. Some say uh, it's a nexus approach or mainstreaming or cross-cutting whatsoever. But important thing is key, you know, climate, inequality, and human rights, gender. These are the important cross-sector uh, uh, intersectional issues. So let's keep that in mind, you know. Uh, let's find the Becky. Your takeaway, please. Uh, Becky is not here. Well, if Ajay is still around, uh, he already left because he has to go to another meeting. So what about uh, other participants? So let me, of course, Josna will be the last, you know, Josna will be the last and also uh, Jamila will be the last. So we have still a few more minutes. Uh, let me ask uh, among participants, uh, Mewish, kindly from Pakistan, you are listening very diligently. Would you like to share one minute takeaway? Yeah, so that would be what I have heard from you, that is PhD, that we have to practice it and we have to experiment it, which is peace, human rights, democracy, and justice, obviously and justice with equity. We don't want just equality, we want equity because we are facing it. So this is take away for me. Okay, so PhD, Peace, Human Rights, Democracy, there's SC16, three pillars of uh, SC16, our civil society language. What about Kopila Kunwar? I'm watching you. You are listening very carefully, attentively. Would you, would you like to share the one minute takeaway? Kopila Kunwar, you are from which country, Kopila? Thank you so much. Uh, I am Gopila Kumar uh, from Nepal. Okay. I am a member of NGO Federation. Okay. I interested and I joined this uh, uh, 
uh, school also, uh, I know the Josna uh, ma'am, but because of my thesis, I am not continue in my class. So I got email from her and very interested. So uh, I joined and whole day I, I listen. It's very um, grateful for me and a good experience also. And um, yeah, this is important to the uh, no poverty, um, zero hunger and uh, uh, equality, gender equality and quality education, good health and well-being for the world people. And it is most important for Nepali people and in Nepal also. I'm working the child right um, and women rights sector. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. It is a great uh, uh, course for me. Yeah. Thank you. I believe the amount of the issues knowledge we are addressing today is equal to the uh, at least one master degree, you know, if not PhD. <laughs> I think it's so important. We so we have you know uh, a lot of input from the presenters. But question is how to cook all this knowledge in terms of concrete action, you know. At the end of the day, we need to have a real impact on the ground. I see the one hands up, the Mac C, uh, C. Vanda. So this will be okay. the last. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, uh, opportunity. I'm actually from Zimbabwe. As we mm. are discussing uh, SDG number 17, I mean number 16, sorry. Uh, as Zimbabwe, we are currently having a, a debate as civil society with the government uh, concerning the NGO Bill, and we are trying to find space as civil society. Or well, what I take from this uh, session is that uh, there is much in terms of uh, how a civil society we can find our space, especially if we work with our government, especially using the multi-sectoral approach. I remember, especially during the. No, issues can do, of, I don't in, have much time. You know, finish your statement. Yes, what I'm. Yes, what I'm trying to bring across is how can we actually bring this uh, to the highest level where can member countries can okay, actually yeah. uh, recognize the civil society space. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. So bring our voice to the highest level of decision making. So now the, before we end, uh, Josna, could you please give us uh, your closing remarks? You have been working so hard to organize all, everything so important for us. Yes, Josna. Why did you ask me to give the closing remark that was you supposed to do this? But thank you so much, Zerno. And uh, it would not have been possible without your support because you, ha you have been the great, great moderator. And I want to thank all my, all my, um, uh, all the presenters, right? Uh, Ali is here, Ali Ajayji, and Priya Dre, and, uh, and uh, Becky, uh, John, we could not play his, uh, but John also, he, he, he uh, recorded the video very very late in the um, uh, in the night and my youth speakers from sri lanka from from pakistan uh, and bangladesh also my my i have an intern um, uh, shudha uh, she she has also recorded her statement and uh, she's also helping me very much and our speakers from uh, from pakistan and afghanistan uh, i want to thank each and every one of you and uh, i also wanted to thank uh, gcap and all our partners, APST, A4, uh, and Forest Tap Network. And, it, and thank you, and more than anything, thank you, Anselmo, for organizing this, uh, for you know, in your, your support and solidarity. I thank all participants, uh, the last, because uh, we have a great turnout, and I'm like really, really happy that you know, you all stayed and for three hours. So thank you so much, and we hope to organize uh, the third SDG 16 plus forum next year. Meanwhile, we'll, we, will be, um, we will be jotting down all the notes and uh, we already have, uh, um, you know, uh, we are preparing the minutes. Shudha, thank you so much for already writing up the, the, the notes, the draft notes. So we will shortly share with you the draft meeting notes and uh, we will come up with the SDG 16 declaration again for this year. Uh, so we will be needing your, sol uh, your uh, solidarity and support and your inputs to the SDG 16 plus declaration this year. We will be soon sharing uh, the format maybe by end of this uh, this week for your inputs. So thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much. Anzalma, back to you. Okay, thank you. Now before we end, the uh, action, cyber actions, show your three fingers, the sign of solidarity for people in Pakistan, 
and Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka, all over the world. There are so much violation of peace, human rights, and justice. Let's show our solidarity, at least from our heart. Okay, three fingers, please. Open your camera. One, two, three. Okay, one more. Next, uh, we have a three time. One, two, three. Here again. One, two, three. One, two, one, two three. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's give a big hands. Okay, see you next time. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.